And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Hey everybody, today we were debating biblical kinds, speciation, and limited ancestry, and we are starting right now. The floor is yours, everybody, whoever would like to take it as we go into open discussion now. Yeah, I, I can definitely start. I do want to thank Adam for his uh, presentation. It, it was fun, and, and that's why I always enjoy discussions with you, because um, like I said, you're fun to talk to. So uh, thanks for that. I do want to ask you a quick question, though, just to clarify. Uh, just because I think you were misrepresenting our uh, opening because biblical kinds would um, indicate a limited ancestry as compared to a universal common ancestry. So uh, both Matt and myself gave, gave a number of differentiating ways that we can determine if all life on earth is universally related through common descent or if limited, um, limited ancestry exists as, as we would say because a lot of what you pointed to was nested hierarchies, right? So whether we look at anatomy, morphology, or even physiology, um, Adam, both models will predict the exact same thing. So we, based on the design model, will also predict uh, nested hierarchical patterns, these groups within groups patterns we see. But um, the model that I uh, briefly touched on was the created heterozygosity hypothesis, which does make make predictions, but the big difference, just so we're not talking past each other, Adam, during the discussion, um, can you reiterate what, what the, the big difference is between my view on genetic diversity and then your view, Adam? You, uh, as from what I can see, the big difference is that I, I look at it as if there are no limits to the genetic variation we see, so there are no limits to the tree of life, and the way I see your position is that you have cutoff points where things are no longer related. Well, no, well, I, I explain that because if, if we're looking at the origin of species and, and we're looking at the origin of traits, well, evolutionists like yourself assume that mutations are the source of all variety. So then you're going to reje re reject our model, which suggests that uh, Adam, Eve, and, and the original created kinds uh, were front-loaded with uh, genetic variety so that was technically my question and just so we're not um talking past each other and we're going over predictions and and the two models the big difference between my model and your model is that we explain the vast majority of nuclear dna differences um adam not by mutation which is how you, you um, explain them. So we just don't want to um, talk past each other, of course. So if you're looking for a barrier and a line drawn in, in phylogeny, I touched on a number of things in my opening, right? Orphan genes, which are taxonomically restricted in essential genes that I, that I believe does demonstrate limited ancestry. So we can't look at these nested hierarchical patterns that you point to. We have to look at, at the blueprint, something that can distinguish between the two models. And you mentioned like conserved genes, for example. Are you familiar with with uh, DNA barcoding and it's conserved traits, not conserved genes. So, are, are like you for instance, the heart is a conserved trait because it's it's not going to go anywhere anytime fast, as opposed to say legs, which right, uh, right. snakes lost or lizards are losing. Right. So, um, I wanted uh, Matt to jump in here, just so I'm not uh, taking up all the time. But we do look to something um, called DNA barcoding, and um, new research uh, using DNA barcoding has actually demonstrated, Adam, and you might be familiar with with this new research that 90% of all life has the same level of genetic diversity, meaning almost all life on Earth is the exact same age, which would would be consistent with with our model, and it has to do with something called DNA barcoding, uh, Matt. Did you want to? Because uh, this will be a, a way we can determine, um, you know, what's what's true: limited ancestry and biblical kinds, or universal common ancestry. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, for instance, when when we're standing back and we're looking at something, we would expect that something that has physical features 
like a like a primate to, to match us more than something like aquatic life. So we would expect the genes to be more similar because that's required for us to have these features. So it, it, we have to dig a little deeper and that's what's great about this DNA barcoding because they look inside the mitochondria and they found that all life on earth has the same 34 genes in the mitochondria. One of them in particular is called this CO1 gene. And when they look at it, they find that it's highly conserved and it's always passed down in specific lineages. It's called Selective Sweep by the guy, uh, I think, Paul Herbert, who invented it. He's a Canadian. And what he found was that when a, for example, when a, um, a horse, a new species of horse pops up, it's going to have the CO1 gene that its parent horse had. And so when it speciates, every single new species of horse will also have that CO1 gene. And they're gapped by little barcoding gaps. And uh, they're single nucleotide variances that we can see and line up. And we've, they've tracked those and they can differentiate. You'll like this for your snakes, for example. They can find a new snake species and they can tell how often they speciate. So we use this same model to determine what a kind is. And we can place these within kinds. Um, one of the best ways of doing that is in 2005, a guy named Vincent Savalanian, I think that's his name. He stated that in order for any two organisms to be deemed the same species, they must share 88 to 98% of the genetic code of the chosen CO1 mitochondria gene fragment. So we're using this in conjunction with orphan genes and uh, other things to determine what a kind is. So uh, if you haven't heard of it, obviously I don't want to jump into studies talking about it. I just wanted to explain kind of what that gene is and why it's highly conserved and why it's always passed on. How would you demonstrate created heterozygosity? Uh, I think in my opening, I explained it really good with the skin color variants because the created heterozygosity model says that the variants within uh, what we see in the world today should have existed in the first people and um, we should see loss or dead ends. And that's what we see. We see like more haplogroups in the first group of people and then we see less today. We see more blood types in the original people. We see less today. So we see things. That's why we like the genetic entropy model, for example. But again, I'm taking standing for truth time. Sorry, man. Go ahead. But th this, th the thing about the position that you take, uh, the pair of you, I assume, take, is that everything went through an identical genetic bottleneck around 4,000 years ago. Is that correct? Right around then, yeah. So you'd expect every single creature to show genetic bottlenecks at that point yes and do they uh they do they all line up in a new study that was done in 2018 and it was actually done using these dna barcoding and what's great is the clear genetic boundaries that they found weren't expected and here's the thing, the genetic bottleneck didn't just exist on land life. It existed in aquatic life too. Matter of fact, the person said, uh, in regards to it, he said, all species show the same lack of barcode diversity. Although it's easy to imagine that humans passed through a bottleneck set 1,700 years ago, it's hard to believe that the exact same thing happened in all species. Did herrings really plast passed through an equally recent population bottleneck and anchovies too. They were perplexed by that because a worldwide cataclysmic bottleneck wouldn't kill all the aquatic life at the same time. So, so what if I brought up, say for instance, cobras. Now they tested the mitochondrial DNA for cobras, uh, a variety of cobras, and the divergence time that they got from measuring the mutation rate was over 10 million years. That's incredible because uh, uh, reptilian mtDNA mutation rates are extremely fast. So they're some of the fastest. But most likely what happens in these uh, studies is they use a phylogenetic method. So they uh, equate it back to uh, the fossil record rather than just using direct observed mutation rates. But we don't like just looking at the, uh, uh, the overall mtDNA. And I'll tell you why. Because when they looked at the mtDNA sequences overall, just standing back and looking at all the 34 genes and all the mutation rates in it, they found that domestic dogs and gray wolves differed by 0.2%. But when they compared to, uh, wolves of the same group in the same lineage of the same you know family they found a huge four percent difference between the same population so they found that it was kind of inconclusive that's why they they found a new way to do it which is going inside this specific gene which is highly conserved the other uh, mtdna 
it was too diverse they found to be specific. So that's what's really okay. cool about the DNA. Yeah. Well, when I when I brought up the Cobras, they didn't use phylogenetic analysis to come up with the mutation rate. They just looked at the differences between known known animals. Uh, they did similar things with, for instance, the Y chromosome in, in us. Um, the lowest estimates for what they what they dubbed Y chromosome Adam is about sixty thousand years. And it's generally believed to be around 200 to 300,000 years ago. And there was a study by Chinese scientists uh, a few years back where they took two people from the same family, um, two Chinese men, 13 generations apart. Uh, so they knew how many generations were between them and they measured the differences in the nucleotide, uh, nucleotide submissions in their Y chromosome. And the rates that they came up with was consistent with the other results we've had in which dates us back to 200 300 thousand years well, how would you uh, explain you that you mentioned that the snakes is the differences between species we were looking at the trio methods when we come up with uh, mutation rates <laughs> rather than between species so that could have been some of the difference but i'll look at your study to see what you mean and uh well, but I can I can come up with example after example after thousands of examples where the G, the the genetics just doesn't match up and if you talk about the um, mitochondrial eve the mutation rate that i assume you're talking about from the parsons paper that was the mutation rate taken from a single russian family everything else even the authors of that paper agreed that the estimated most recent common ancestor for uh, mitochondria is a minimum of around ninety thousand years well, what, that Parsons study was done in uh, April 1997, if I can remember. And what happened yeah, it was, is yeah. it was actually reevaluated the next year uh, by uh, Gibbons. And she not only got the exact same thing, she got even less of a mutation rate, dropping it down to 6,000. 6, and that was published in Nature's journal. And then what happened is the FBI actually picked it up and they still use it to this day. So they yep. believe in, in the mutation rate so much, the FBI use it as investigate as a uh, forensic. The mutation rate does not it, it doesn't give the exact year that it came put it this way mutation rates differ not only between species but within smaller populations well that's what jensen's doing he's making predictions on mutation rates as well uh he he challenges anybody he'll take you right now and go and pick an animal in the wild and predict its mutation rate he says he can do it and no evolutionist can. So how? So why then? When Actually, because it's the same process. You wanted to. Can I just finish this point before? Yeah, yeah, yeah take, your time. take your time. So the same method by which you came, they came up with a six thousand year number is the exact same method that they tested on the Chinese men, where the date for divergence for the Y chromosome was about two hundred to three hundred thousand years. It was the same method. They took it from the same family and tested the mutation rates between individuals. And they came up with the rate that gave uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Why is that wrong? But the mitochondrial Eve one is correct. Go ahead, Standing. You're yeah, up. so uh, I was just going to ask you. So for that one, I mean, we'd have to, like, for example, as, as uh, Matt iterated, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen is, is making very specific predictions on mitochondrial DNA and people groups, for example, the Khoisan people groups, where their um, mitochondrial DNA rate has not actually been measured, right? Because we have measured mitochondrial rates, as, as you're talking about here in, um, in, in non-African people groups, I think I misspoke there, in African people groups, like the Khoisan peoples is who he's uh, making predictions on. So have, have you or have, are you familiar with any papers or anything that's making uh, very specific and pre precise predictions on mtDNA mutation rates in people groups that have not yet been, been measured? On, on, people, on groups of people that haven't been measured yet? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, because uh, Dr. Nathan... No, no, I Okay, so um, because yeah, it, when when we use the empirical method um, and, and trace the mitochondrial DNA or even the the Y chromosome um, DNA back to two common ancestors, uh, we're just using as as Matt said, we're using the, the empirical method, right? Pedigree based studies. And um, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen came out with a paper recently where he he looked at the um, Y chromosomes. I'm not too sure if you're um, familiar 
with it, but he, he pointed out that if humans have, have actually been around for several hundred thousands of, of years or more, as, as you know, the evolutionists would say, they should have accumulated eight to 59 times the amount of mutations that, that we actually currently observe in, in Y chromosome DNA um, sequ sequence. But the, the researchers in, in that current study, they empirically demonstrated that we only observe about 4,500 years of uh, mutation accumulation in the paternal ancestry contained, obviously, in the record of, of the human Y chromosome. And, and Dr. Jensen in, invites anybody to uh, respond to that paper, uh, as well as, as make uh, future testable predictions on, um, on, on the Y chromosome and, and mitochondrial DNA, just as, as he has. Right. I still, I still don't understand what you you obviously have a problem with this study by the Chinese authors who looked at the pedigree and found the mutation rate consistent with thousand years difference or ancestry. Why would that be a problem? Oh, well, um, well, you got to look, you got to uh, remember that the Y chromosome, according to evolutionary mechanisms is degraded it's always been degrading and they don't consider it the same as the y uh, the x chromosome at all so they have a different assumption going into it so by going into it with the assumption that the y chromosome is degrading three times faster than the x the mathematical assumption and the model from it are all over the discrepancies match based on the what's going into it rather than just going oh well this is what we see based on the trio study that's that's really not what's happening because of the fact that they think that the Y chromosome has is is evolutionary falling out. They said I think that in what one hundred thousand years the Y chromosome will be completely gone. They believe that's how fast it's degrading from the populations. Okay, if I could, um, could we move on more specifically to the concept of kinds? Yes, uh, um, and I think that's a great topic, just so we don't stay on one thing for too long. I did want to ask you, I guess, re regardless of, of our disagreements or our differences in, in opinions on when this, you know, Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA ancestor existed, I am curious because you seem open-minded. Um, why then, you know, based on genetic uh, data, Adam, if, if we're looking to the Bible as, as our starting point and we're looking at, uh, you know, human history and, and limited ancestry, when we actually do focus, though, on, on the variation of, of the Y chromosome that we're talking about here in the world today and the fact that the Y chromosomes have very little variation, not to mention every single human being on the planet is 99.9 percent .9 similar, right? That's why the evolutionists had to invent the out of Africa um, Scenario and the same thing goes with mitochondrial DNA, which does suggest we came at least from from two ancestors Regardless of our disagreements in, in when how come that isn't you know convincing evidence to you that maybe the Genesis account uh, Does have some validity to it take your time because every bit of evidence out there Doesn't accord with it Everything well, I uh, I mean, you, are you, you, you've given one example, which is mostly the mitochondrial Eve example, where it seems it seems on the surface to line up with roughly six thousand years. Which, so that, that's one big example of cherry picking. If if it weren't just one example, you you wouldn't be talking specifically about that one example. You'd be saying this is the pattern that we see, this is the trend. But no, you bring up one specific example because that's the only one that lines up with how you want the world to be. Well, no, I, I was looking at the entire genetic structure in humans as a whole. That speaks to us of a literal Adam and Eve. I mean, that but small if, DNA if compartment I, if mitochondria. I could jump in there, I've given an example where mutation rates witnessed between Chinese men dates the Y chromosome at several hundred thousand years. So that's not the whole human genome because that goes against right. your point, and that is part of the genome. Well, then, and that's why I countered that with, with the new study uh, that Dr. Jensen has, has put out uh, that I'll send to you. It, it's very new, and he's, he's looked at that study as well as other studies on, on different uh, Y chromosome mutation rates um, that, that points still to a um, you know, Y chromosome variation and origin of, of 4,500 years. But, I mean, like you said, maybe at, at this point we, we should just go. To, I was just kind of curious um, as to what um, – as to what would, you know might convince you of uh, of limited of limited ancestry at least in regards to to humans. So well, if you in order, to, move in, to, in order to convince me, you'd have to show me something that would convince me. Uh, if I could move on to kinds, then quickly. Sure. Um, 
what was I going to ask? I, I, I had a question in my mind. It was, um, oh yeah, here we go. So we're here now. Say you had a time machine and you zoomed forward in time, assuming the earth was still around at this point. Fast forward a hundred million years. What do you think life would look like? So if we fast forwarded a hundred million years from now, yeah. well, I, I think that's actually a good question because, um, you know, based on mutation accumulation, right? I mean, we know we inherit about 100 new mutations per person per generation. And based on the known functionality of, of the genome, most of those are um, deleterious. So if I were to look a hundred million years in, into the future, I would see uh, extinction because that's exactly where we are heading since there's no type of selection uh, that can remove all these deleterious mutations. Just, you, you, said, you said there that most mutations are deleterious. Yes. That's, that's not true. Well, it is true because... Most, most of them are neutral. No, well, I mean, according to the assumptions of um, evolution, most would be neutral, but that's just because evolutionists assume that the majority of our genome is based on evolutionary leftovers, junk DNA, genomic fossils, but that's actually a direct prediction of the created heterozygosity hypothesis that would suggest that the vast majority of our DNA, our DNA elements, for example, ERVs, ALUs, and these other classes of retrotransposons would be functional. And that's exactly what we're now seeing. That means the more functional the genome is, Adam. Can, can, I, can I just ask quick, quickly then, did you make that did they make that prediction before we found that out? Yes, in, in, intelligent design advocates have always predict have always predicted um, genome function increases in in levels of genome function. That's why the evolutionist community attacks the findings of of the ENCODE project because Adam, the ENCODE project has has shown that most of the human genome is is functional, and not and not only that, but functional on many levels. I mean, we have layer upon layer upon layer of of programming within the. Um, the, the genome. And are, are you familiar with, with all the known functions in these retro transposons and in the endogenous retroviruses and, and pseudogenes? I'm not familiar with every single one, no. Um, yeah, so Dr. Nathaniel Jensen in his model of uh, created heterozygosity, and, and that's why I asked you uh, to clarify your understanding of where we explain um, the origin of the vast majority of um, you know genetic diversity, for example, in, in the nuclear DNA, because it's it's two opposite expectations and, and predictions. I mean, how much of our genome, on a percentage-wise, both uh, protein coding and, and non-protein coding, would you say um, is is functional according to your model? According to my model, I'm, not, I'm I don't know. I don't know the number, unfortunately. What, and it, it is very low, like I've, I've uh, debated PhDs on this, and, and they have to assume junk, for one, in order to counterbalance the uh, mutations that are, that are building up in the genome, because they need to assume that they are neutral, that they're not actually damaging the uh, genome. But even if, and it's, it's funny, because the evidence suggests that we, we have a genome of function, but even if, just for sake of argument, uh, you know, just to not uh, discuss this topic forever, even if I said, okay, let's say, let's pretend that the genome really is 90% junk. That still means that's 10 new deleterious mutations that, that are pouring in, into the genome per person, per generation. And most of those being unselectable because natural selection, Adam, only acts on the most detrimental of mutations and the most deleterious mutations, but it does nothing against the nearly neutral mutations. Those are uh, invisible to selection. So my answer to your so, question, if we were to go 100 million years into the future, it's a very simple question. I mean, life, life would not exist. And I guess you would have to explain uh, how natural selection can keep life in existence for, for that long. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you talked about genetic entropy. Now, I, I looked up genetic entropy, and the only places I could find it on Google Scholar were creationist sources, uh, specifically from John Sanford. And all the examples I see are very specific species-specific examples, mostly humans. Now, the problem with humans in the natural world is that we've sort of done away with natural selection. So, yeah, deleterious mutations are more numerous than beneficial ones. So over time, if there is no selection press, press, pressure, you'll have more of a buildup of deleterious mutations. However, natural selection 
in the wild, assuming that it's 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 able to do what it needs to do, will prune the wild populations of deleterious um, mutations and keep the positive ones. So right. that's how you maintain populations. That's what natural selection does. It gets rid of the bad and it keeps the good. What's fit for the environment that the creature is living in. That's how populations are sustained and that's how they have been sustained. Right. I really appreciate that response because you made up, you made some good points. I just don't think that you've addressed the nearly neutral mutations that, that would build up because the same thing goes, and I don't want to take all the time. I know Matt has some good examples of uh, genome um, degradation and health, for example, is kind of his specialty. So I'll let him take over in one second, but I do want to point out the fact that, um, yeah, in humans, so you, obviously you're admitting that we are degenerating, but you are uh, um, saying that it's uh, due to a, a lack of natural selection, right? Uh, which right. makes sense, but it would come down to, um, let's say, animal populations. It would still come down to genome function a as a whole, because even in animal populations, they still have to assume that the majority of the genome is junk in order that the junk areas can absorb the mutations, making them neutral. But the fact is, Adam, and you have to address it, is the evolutionist has lost one of their favorite pieces of evidence, which is uh, not only junk DNA, but also the presence of these ancient deactivated viruses that they say are in, in the genome. Because rather than being functionless um, vestigial remnants of our past, these retrotransposons, as a direct prediction from our model, turn out to be functionally integrated into the amazingly um, complex regulatory uh, genetics and, and genomes of, of mammalian genomes. So that means that total functionality with all these DNA elements, DNA sequences, will speed up and make the degeneration problem that much worse in humans uh, and in animals. Take your time. I, I am very curious because you keep saying that intelligent design predicted. Who predicted it and when? Um, so, so there have been predictions in, in the past. I can get you specific names. For example, Dr. Jonathan Wells has, has made those types of predictions. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has in print right now new predictions that the vast majority, over 80% of our genome, because ENCODE, they did what's called biochemical tests, right? So uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen predicts that um, using uh, genetic knockout tests will reveal exactly what types of uh, functions these DNA differences have. Because if we predict that the vast majority of DNA differences are actually um, functional, Adam, that would be um, evidence for that exact hypothesis. We're seeing that with the overturning of, of the junk DNA. I mean, what was called junk DNA, we now know can modify the way chromosomes, right, the packages of, of DNA were organized. And then what that does is it changes the the, the way the DNA functions. It's It's... DNA function yeah. on multiple levels. I mean, how do you non address all that? Non-coding areas of the genome do right. exist in large quantities. And in fact, sure. it's one of the ways that you get um, de novo genes, which explains orphan genes. So, for example, uh, a study recently looked at crests, uh, several species of crests, and they found that these lineage-specific genes, what they call orphan genes, right. were actually just mutations of non-coding DNA that didn't do anything in other species of crests. Right, and, and that's the assumption. So, um, no, it's not an assumption. No, I, 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 well, no, I, I understand that you know the uh, explanation for these taxonomically restricted and essential genes is de novo gene synthesis. I'll address that in a second, but um, I, I wanted to point out that if if the genome truly is junk in the non-coding region most of it you know has no active role um but then the encode project has revealed that over 80 percent of it is actively transcribed into rna and the evolution say well that's just biochemical testing but my question to you would be if it truly was junk and there was no useful activity there going on in the non-coding regions why adam would the cell even bother with it because wouldn't you agree that that activity that is discovered would be just a waste of energy and resources and natural selection, which we were talking about earlier, should have eliminated um, that junk long ago, according to evolution. How do you answer that? I, uh, I'd have to look into it more. I couldn't answer off the top of my head without sounding like a complete dunce. <laughs> No, 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 that's okay. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I do want to pass on to Matt Roca because um, his expertise on, on health and, and genetic degeneration, I wanted him to at least point out a few uh, examples. I would examples. like to just interject something here. Um, I would like to eventually get back to kinds because we, we keep drifting back to 
uh, evolution stuff and the, well, and no, it, your I, ideas I that disprove evolution. Well, no, it's not disproving evolution because, um, and, and I know that the uh, assumptions and basic worldviews of, of evolution, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, put themselves into the mindset of a creationist because what we're saying is that the vast majority of DNA differences were the result of divine creation. And evolutionist says it's, it's mutations over time. That means we have two very different expectations and predictions on ancestry. You would expect... Um, you know, a genome of junk, evolutionary left, leftovers and genomic fossils, we would expect a genome of function and DNA elements. That's what's going to help us determine whether or not everything's related or whether or not limited ancestry, uh, according to the Bible, is, is what's true. And that's exactly what, what uh, we're pointing out here and, and demonstrating. Okay. Is that we so so what, what, could you explain then why every, every creature, if you test them genetically, comes up into this well-defined tree right and that's a good question you're, you're going back to the uh, nested hierarchical patterns the groups within groups patterns that, that we see in life and as i pointed out in, in the beginning the design model predicts and expects the exact same thing that's why we have to look at differentiating evidence which would be function how do we test uh, you know, for ancestry, it, it would be uh, function, a genome of function versus a, a genome of junk. But to, uh, like you said, let's let, let's go more into into kinds and, and more expectations of, um, you know, speciation from, say, the original kinds, because I, I know that's what you want to talk about. And I think that would be enjoyable for um, the audience. But can we just reserve just one second for Matt to jump in and, and make yeah, a point about genetic entropy? Yep. And then we'll go right to to kinds and definition of kinds and things like that? Yeah, that's absolutely fine with me. All right. I'll just get it over with real quick. A perfect example is uh, a video that I made which shows uh, Neanderthal. It shows that they have less overall genetic mutations in their entire genome, and today we have a lot more. Um, we also have something called the MTHFR gene, and it's broken anywhere between 40 to 70% in almost all people on Earth. And it's that gene determines on how well you methylate and how well your other genes work and how good they are. So it kind of shows a genome collapse by looking at that. But, you know, that doesn't really have much to do with kinds. It's just an overview of showing that the genome is kind of crumbling and breaking down. We see gene loss. We don't see new genes arising in our genome going up. We see it going down in all life. So I will, uh, I will, I will just put a point on that. We do see genes arising. I mentioned the CRESS earlier where they identified many non-coding sequences um, becoming de novo genes. So we do see increases in genes. We also see anatomical increases, which are results of genes so for instance dogs um, more primitive dogs uh, wolves and huskies uh, don't have puppy dog eyes because they lack two muscles around the eyes um, whereas more recent breeds of dogs have these muscles and that is a result of mutations that came about uh, to benefit dogs that live with us because we love puppy dog eyes I think that's a beautiful example of evolution in action that happened during human history. But the uh, but these de novo genes that are arising spontaneously, kind of uh, like out of nowhere, that really are considered uh, junk DNA are actually functional elements. So we can't just say that these are randomly arising, but yet these de novo genes are absolutely required for functions in the gene in, in the body. If they were just, that's what makes the. Uh, the orphan gene so fascinating is because they're lineage specific. So it also helps prove our model a little bit because they are taxonomically restrictive genes, but they're also functional elements, which Standing mentioned earlier. The um, fact that the fact that genes become active from non-coding genes, it, I don't see how it proves your point. I don't see how uh, it lines up with it. And, and I like I like your point on orphan genes. Um, Adam, but I, we would just have to see actual, you know, papers that are showing a non-coding region of our genome suddenly popping up and having an incredible, incredibly functional role. Because um, okay. if you look at the one on Cress, it was quite recent. If you look up Cress, uh, Cress de novo genes on Google Scholar over the last, I think, I think it was 2016. If you look it, there's right. about 500 um, de novo it, genes that come up from non-coding regions. And we have looked at, at many papers, I just want to put this out there, is that in what you're saying, just to reiterate, um, these orphan genes were created um, supposedly from just uh, random mutational events in the non-coding regions, and um, they've 
now uh, co-opted function in the uh, protein coding regions. They're not right. Is that how you would explain the the we, we see we see the non-coding regions. The, the reason we didn't see them before is because they were non-coding, so we didn't know, right. really know what we we're looking for. But when we found these genes in this certain species of crest, we look back at other species of crest and check for that same sequence and find that it's a non-coding region of the DNA. Well, I, I'm saying crest. I'm assuming you think crest would be in, within the same kind. I am right, right. Uh, well, and I'm just saying, I'll give you plenty of time. I'm just saying that because evolutionists reject this concept of, of engineered design in, in biological uh, systems, when they see the presence of these taxonomically uh, restricted orphan genes, they have to come up with a way as to how these uh, cleverly you know, designed DNA sequences were um, somehow randomly uh, generated in very recent evolutionary time. And, and you look to de novo gene synthesis, but my response to that would be that it's, it's based more on a circular argument because evolutionists say, okay, de novo gene synthesis must be true because why? Orphan genes exist. And orphan genes exist because of de novo gene synthesis. So not I don't know how there, you there, are, there are various sure. methods for de novo, um, not de novo genes, orphan genes. You've also got things like fission and fusion of genes. You've got um, gene duplication and exon shuffling uh, off the top of my head. Right, right. But a lot of times in these papers, for example, um, one that I <coughs> myself are really familiar with are the so-called introduction of new orphan genes in fruit flies. Uh, Matt, did you want to touch on that real quick? Because orphan genes, you must understand, for one, could be lost as well, which could explain why you're seeing some in, uh, you know, some species in, in the same kind that other species in the same kind don't have. Did you want to touch on that real quick, Matt? Yeah, real quick. They, they took fruit flies and they, they looked inside of their uh, orphan gene status and they wanted to try to um, get them out. So what they did is they bred fruit flies, a specific species of them, to have zero um, orphan genes in their bodies just to see what would happen. So they bred them entirely out after maybe uh, 10 generations or so, completely gone. So the flies were living without any orphan genes in their body. Okay, I just want to make a correction. I said 2016 for the Crest paper is actually 2011. So if you wanted to search on it, it's a paper from 2011. Can we move on to kinds then? Uh, I don't know how much time we've got left, but I yeah, think let's let's do that because I did notice even in the audience, you know, they're saying what's well, you know, what's the definition of kind, and and I know that you've asked that many times. And yeah, prior. I think that's a great way to start. I would love to hear your definition of kinds and be able to apply it suitably. Okay, so. Uh, I would say that that my best definition of kinds would be groups of living organisms, Adam, that belong in the same created kind if if they have descended from the same ancestral gene pool. So I think if it, if it comes down to inference, for example, we can infer with pretty good certainty, of Adam, that dogs, wolves, coyotes, and foxes all go back to an original ancestral gene pool. But we cannot, okay, we cannot scientifically infer that dogs, wolves, pine trees, and banana plants go back to an original ancestral gene pool. I want to make one last point, and you can talk as long as you want. Just like uh, Matt iterated earlier and explained about the DNA barcoding and the CO1 gene in, in the mitochondria, um, that research demonstrates that 90% of all life has the same level of genetic diversity, meaning almost all life on Earth. Um, is, is the same age and came into existence, well, in our model, according to the flood, at, at the same time. That DNA bar barcoding puts a line in the phylogeny, which is exactly what you'd be asking for, um, for kinds. Take your time. So your definition, uh, put, put simply, is if they descend from the same gene pool. Is that correct? Yeah, that would, yeah that's good. How would you demonstrate that? Um, Good question. So we would use, as as Matt kind of talked about earlier, the DNA barcoding. Uh, we could use that. We can use. It's a variety of things. It's it's a trio of things. We can look at uh, orphan genes. We can look at taxonomically restricted endogenous retroviruses, uh, DNA function, and and most importantly, we can actually look at species. And we can look at their speciation rates because Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has made very specific predictions on speciation rates, and we can see if that fits. Um, empirically with uh, the original kinds coming off of the ark just just 4,500 years ago. We yeah, can look in at, order for that to work, you'd have to know how many kinds came off the ark, wouldn't you? Right, right. So, I mean, well, we can do... Um, so that's, that's circular reasoning there. You'd, well, no, you'd no, see because how many speciation events you'd need 
according to how many kinds came off the ark in order to find how many kinds came off the ark. Well, the, the thing is, we would have to make um, hypotheses, for example. Okay, so if we look at, let, let's say, um, the cat kind that, that came off the ark or the dog kind or even the bear kind, okay? If we go back to this idea of pre-existing diversity, okay, this means, and, and I think after um, we talked about it for a while, you understand it now, this means that God created Adam and Eve and the kinds with differences within themselves, okay? So uh, that hypothesis, Hypothesis can can apply universally among species. So if we if we take the cat ancestor aboard the ark, okay, let's say that cat ancestor was was front loaded with a whole bunch of functional DNA differences at creation. These front loaded functional DNA differences um, has led to the origin of species. Let's so Noah brings aboard two cats, Adam, and now we have everything from tigers to house cats to jaguars and in between. Or with dogs, Noah brings two dogs. Now we have everything from wolves to coyotes to jackals to foxes. And, and in between and ultimately the domestic dog but you've got no evidence to say that that's what happened it's just it's just a post hoc rationalization right even right. though we find that genetics says that, that we have common ancestors for say cobras 10 million years ago no, that's no, all what? within genetics no and that's a good point but i'm just explaining how it's possible to get all these numbers of species and how we can explain the because if we look at um, for example, you got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, so we would say, according to the biblical view, that God created kinds, which would be more so the family level. Uh, you know, not species or genus, but but family. Now I'm showing you how that's possible to get all the ancestors and all the species from uh, some kinds on the ark. Now, now we make predictions. Uh, to see if, if this lays out because a hypothesis without any testable falsifiable predictions is would be failed it wouldn't be science so that's why we've made uh, we've, we can look at snakes for example I know Matt's got some numbers on that we can look at birds we can look at lizards um, I don't want to take up all the time Matt if you want to take this next part and go into the actual speciation rates of snakes which is kind of that's uh, Adam's field or birds for example and go over the hypotheses there I'd, I'd love to talk about snakes Sure. Okay. All right, then we'll just go with snakes. Um, uh, well, I guess we'll go with a couple different things at the same time. Um, if if the speciation rate of snakes shows that it's about 1.2 per year, and we extrapolate that back about 3, 4,350 years, somewhere around there for Noah's Ark flood, we should see around a variety of snakes, which is uh, associated with that type of speciation rate number. But if evolution was true, even going back 1 million years would have somewhere around 1 million snakes, even though that would be even more because we have to account for some extinctions. But I mean, snakes are found back 167 million years and snakes are very hardy animals. They, they do really good. Matter of fact, even if you go back to the fossil record, uh, the evidence of intermediary fossils between these snakes and lizards are just really aren't even there. All of a sudden we just have snakes and then all of a sudden there's just lizards. Lizards that are snakes that don't have any anatomical features as the snakes. So just snakes appear randomly. And then all of a sudden their speciation rates don't match the pattern of how many snakes there should be in the world today if their speciation rate that we see today doesn't match up at all. Our model fits much more clear with what we see. Okay, I, I remember reading this, I think, from your 100 plus falsifications evolution, the 1.2 figure. And I, I tried to look up that source, but I couldn't find that figure. So if at some point you could pass that on to me. That is, I don't even remember what group of snakes it was from. Uh, you mentioned... There are no intermediary snakes, but I could name a few. Uh, Tetrapodophis, which was a four-legged snake. Um, Najash, which was a two-legged snake. And you've got the Anilides. Anilidia, it's, I can't pronounce some of these, but it's a snake with a jaw like a lizard. And that's the same with the uh, Coniophis, which again is another a snake with a lizard's head. And these are all roughly around the time that they were supposed to have diverged from lizards. They still are lizards. Um, that's I mentioned this in my opening. You have to scrap the entire idea of taxonomy because it just doesn't work in your model. Snakes are lizards, but I'm assuming you don't think that, even yeah. though genetics and ta um, cladistics puts them in the same group. Snakes are a type of lizard. So we have in the fossil record snakes with legs, Snakes with lizard-like jaws, snakes without um, the ventral scales. So one of the more defining features of more advanced snakes is the single scale down the body. 
we have snakes alive today that have uh, cylindrical bodies with scales all around without the ventral scales. There are plenty of examples of intermediary snakes. Well, did you realize, though, that that goes actually contrary to what snakes need to be in your fossil record? The oldest snakes that go back 167 million years ago, they found four different varieties and none of them actually had legs. So if, if they evolved losing their legs, we would see that transition. We see the opposite. We see snakes with no legs and then all of a sudden some snakes that have just hind legs and then all of a sudden one variety that had some vestigial front little tiny remnants and then back to no legs again. So that's the opposite. Of I, I mentioned at the start of my at the start of my talk that there are some features of animals that are very easy to lose. Fish and snakes lose eyes in caves. Um, legs are one of those things that just so happen to be one of those things that are easy to lose. Yeah, but and you have the idea of sister species as well. So when the snakes start to diversify, there'll be loads of different groups of these snake-like lizards going around. Some would lose legs quicker than others in different environments, and you'd have this whole cluster. I mean, you have it today. We have lizards today that have no legs. We have lizards that have two front legs, and we have lizards that just have stumps where their legs should be. They're very easy to lose. Yeah, but uh, you know the the very first snake that you find in the fall in your fossil record goes back th that has any back limbs is twenty million years. But yet the oldest snakes, when supposedly split from a lizard, have no legs at all. That go back to one hundred sixty seven million. No, so I'm pretty sure I, I mentioned Tetrapophodus. I think that was that was at least a hundred million years. Najash as well uh, was ancient, and that had like that had legs as well. But these oldest four varieties, again, they, they had no legs. They just There was nothing there. And that's the oldest, deepest part of the fossil record, which should have the highest amount of vestigial leg bones present because they're the first transition from a lizard. But there's none. You say the first transition from a lizard, the first known one. There would probably be a lot of populations of lizards before that had started to lose their legs. Just because we the first example of a snake we find doesn't have legs, it doesn't mean that they didn't evolve. But let's, let's get back to the main point. Are snakes part of the lizard kind? Uh, no, because we find that they, on the DK, DNA barcoding level, they are separated. We find them, they have different um, uh, barcoding gaps. And any barcoding gap that, that is too large will place them into a different family. Now, DNA barcoding is the first time they've ever been able to use it on a species level. So that's all they use it on. But it works in larger conjunctions. They, that's why that guy in 2005 determined if the gap is above a certain amount, uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, there it is. If the gap is anywhere between underneath 88% of genetic code variances with the mitochondrial fragment, then it's a different kind. It's a different species altogether. Yeah, I've, throughout this debate, I've, um, I've, I've not mentioned, I don't know much about this DNA barcode. I'm, I realize it's been mentioned a lot of times. And for the most part, I've tried to um, just avoid it too much because I don't know much about it. Um, what I do know is that snakes, when compared to lizards genetically, fall between, they're close to the iguanas. Um, I showed you the picture earlier with the gecko being the out group. A gecko is further related, um, a snake and an iguana are closer related than either is to the gecko. Do you think that geckos and iguanas are the same kind? I would say no, because some get varieties of geckos don't even eat food. There's one variety that doesn't eat for like its entire lifespan. It just absorbs things through its skin. And I, it's, it seems to me as though they're, they're very different. I, I seem to get the impression that you think that because there are differences at the gene level or behavioral level in some animals, that means they're different kinds. Well, remember, for us to be related to an aquatic species, there we would have to there would have to be a lot of not only just the same genes, but the same function of these genes. That's why Standing for Truth is saying that the function is what matters. That's why this selective sweep gene is so important because it does the same thing in every species. So when it's passed on, you can find this little teeny little bit of difference between species, but a big difference between kinds. So that's what's really fascinating to us. And the thing I, is, and, yeah. and Adam, that's why and it's, it's okay if you don't, if you're not up on the DNA barcoding, but in order to draw a line in uh, ancestry and in phylogeny, 
um, where nested hierarchical patterns exist in anatomy, genetics, and physiology, it's going to take and require some type of differentiating evidence. And this new study and, and the, the analyses they've done in, in, in barcoding, um, in, in DNA barcoding, really has revealed gaps, huge gaps in, in these in these species and in families. And it, it's more, it's consistent with um, uh, limited ancestry, special creation, and um, in biblical kind. So that, that's kind of the point of the, of the DNA um, barcoding. If you want to respond to that, that's fine. I do want to ask you a, a question afterwards about um, more so uh, speciation rates according to the evolution model. But you can respond to that first if you like. Yeah, again, I think if we have another discussion, I'm going to look up this DNA barcoding and uh, come up with it because that seems to be what you're falling back onto now. And if I can't address it, then we, we've hit a bit of a standstill on that point as far as I'm concerned. I do want to ask, is what kind does Tiktaalik fall into? Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever tested it uh, just because it never brought, uh, popped up on the radar. It can be tested if there's enough genetic evidence in, or material in the bones. For example, they've tested uh, Denisovan and Neanderthal and compared it to human beings. So if they're able to extract it from Denisovan, then I'm guessing they can do it from Tiktaalik. I just don't think that that's been on anybody's radar. <laughs> you know, no, I don't think you're going to get much genes from Tiktaalik. And, and, and that's the problem is that it's, you know, what's inherited sperm and egg, as I iterated a, a few times, it's genes, it's traits, it's genetics. That's why when we're looking for, for an answer to ancestry, you know, a fossil is, is not inherited, Adam. You know, ge geography is not inherited. It's, it's genetics. We have to look at, at the gene level. And that's why we look to DNA barcoding. That's why we look to DNA function is, is key, as well as um, certain taxonomically restricted genes, including the endogenous retroviruses and, and other things like that. But we have discussed that in, in great detail. So uh, just according to your model, though, when it comes to speciation, what would be a prediction uh, or expectation that you would have uh, regarding speciation rates and, and speciation events like does it take millions of years for speciation events to occur or can you go into that a bit speciation takes as long as the environment requires it to because speciation tends to happen when a new niche is opened or a niche is vacated by another creature so that's what that's what the whole basically punctuated equilibrium thing was all about where not much can happen for a while if the environment's in a pretty stable condition but if something big were to happen say a volcano were to go off and radically change the environment in some near vicinity then you'd have a lot of adapting to do now adapting a lot of times can lead to speciation so it's not a constant rate thing it's very much dependent on what's happening around these organisms at the time now would you but would you say that the average speciation events speciation speciation events sorry would would take millions of years like on average according to the evolutionary model because obviously according to our model it's completely different expectations and predictions because we're expecting all these species in just a few thousands of years and you would be expecting all these species in in hundreds of thousands to millions of years it's not something you, you can really put an average on because it can depend on a whole host of factors. Generation time can be a factor. The rate of mutations in certain parts of the genome because the, the rates differ across the board. That can be a factor. The uh, speed at which organisms diversify, it could be not down to genetics if something reproduces or not. It could be down to size of the organism. Do you think you're going to get a great dane to mate with a chihuahua without artificial insemination? If humans disappeared, and every breed apart from the Great Dane Chihuahua disappeared, would they be the same species? Oh, ask that again real quick, Adam. You're if, the, if humans died out, say coronavirus kills us all. Right. And every dog breed apart from the Great Dane and the Chihuahua survived, would they be a new species? No, no, because because you could, like you said, artificially ins inseminate them. Yeah, in but we're, we're not. We died. We, we, coronavirus wiped us out. Artificial insemination doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, no, they would be because it, there you go. We go back to DNA barcoding. We go back to we have to look at the blueprint. We have to look under the hood. I can't look at a Civic and Elantra, a Jetta, and a Chrysler 200 and you know determine uh, you know 
where they came from, who engineered them without looking at the uh, bin number, the blueprint, the um, you know details, the engine, for example. You can't just the look big, at the, the, the big difference. Over. The big difference with cars is they don't have shared derived characteristics, which is how systematics works. Because a car, you can put anything on a car because they're made by people. We right. know how cars are made. We make them. We know how organisms come about. They reproduce and wow. they to go through genetic recombination. So they, they can't just add a spoiler. They can't add a, a boom stereo in the boot. They're restricted to what genes bring about. Cars... We make them. We change them. If we were to put cars into a systematic diagram, if we were try to make cladistics out of cars, depending on their features, it would be a mess. And that's why you cannot compare the two. Well, no, uh, it wouldn't be a mess, just as I demonstrated in the beginning, that it just so uh, happens to turn out that uh, designed modes of, of transportation that humans have designed and built, they do naturally fall within a groups within groups nested hierarchical pattern, whether you like it or not. And those patterns, Adam, can be seen both at the visible level and at the um, blueprint level. And according to our model, if God created us and made us uh, in, in his image, then we should be able to get a, a sense or an idea for how he created life based on the things that, that we Create. And okay. Lo and okay. Behold, let's, let's, we create. I'm almost done. I didn't interrupt you. We um, we create modes of transportation, and, and you can see this with with sedans, SUVs, vans. You can go all the way uh, to airplanes and boats, and the materials that are used. They fall within groups within uh, groups patterns. And uh, evolutionists often do say that you know cars don't reproduce. Well, for one, that's a misunderstanding of, of the design model and the predictions that flow from it. And two, adding reproduction adds complexity, and that actually is is no help to um, those that hold to universal common ancestry. Take your time. So if we were to try to look for the synapomorphies, uh, the shared drive characteristics of vehicles, say, for instance, we've got a bicycle. Bicycles don't have engines, do they? So your, your typical pedal bicycle. Cars have engines. I assume you'd, you'd say then, uh, well, not just cars, but lots of vehicles have engines. You'd say that an engine would count as a shared derived characteristic. Well, no, you can you can uh, make a, a list and compile and classify all modes of transportation that are powered vehicles, and then you can have a separate class or a, a separate uh, group or category of non-powered uh, vehicles, which bicycles would fall into. But even if you look at the uh, if, you, if you look at the microscopic level, if you look at the materials used, the metals used, you're still just like in DNA, you're still going to find uh, nested hierarchical. Patterns. I mean, this is just a fact. You can't get away from it. That's why we have to look at, Adam, differentiating lines of evidence, DNA barcoding, DNA function, orphan genes, okay. um, the, the number of DNA differences. But I, I, the, the thing, and we can go back to that, but I don't want to just go too far away from the species thing. So I was just trying to clarify some things just to make some points on, on the speciation. Yeah, I didn't finish my analogy, so I'd like to go back okay, to that. Okay, finish yeah. it. Yep, go ahead. So the bicycle, the pedal bicycle does not have an engine. Hold on, excuse me. <coughs> the bicycle does not have an engine so if we were to make a big cladogram of vehicles bicycles would be in the section where the engine wasn't a shared derived characteristic my uncle put an engine on his bicycle a pedal bicycle and zoomed down the road so that shared derived characteristic is no longer a shared derived characteristic because somebody put it on a bike that's why the systematic diagram for vehicles would fail because it would be a complete mess. Anyone can put anything on anyone. You, a, a rabbit does not grow feathers. You can't just, it, nobody just puts feathers on a rabbit. And that's why there's this big difference because it's all about inheritance, things you inherit. That's well, my answer I mean, to that. And that's why I think the cars example fails completely. But see, the thing is just basic observation on modes of transportation. And, and I understand that, you know, evolutionists don't like the fact that modes of transportation uh, without even uh, meaning to do so, they do actually fall within uh, nested hierarchical uh, patterns. Maybe you can point out some inconsistencies, just like I can point out some inconsistencies in uh, the phylogenetic tree of life. Because although there are nested hierarchical patterns in life, both on uh, an app, anatomical level and, and a genetic level, uh, there are inconsistencies. That's the whole point of, you know, incomplete lineage sorting, depending on what gene you're looking, creates different types of trees. You can look at convergent evolution. You can look at many different types of inconsistencies in, in the phylogenetic uh, uh, tree. But 
um, according to our model, if, if we do predict some type of nests and hierarchical patterns in DNA and in anatomy, it makes sense because even if we look at, let's say, um, humans, pigs, mice, and ducks, okay, so we would say they are all land dwelling, uh, but we would also say that they are all of separate kinds. But since, Adam, they are all land dwelling, they are going to share similar nested hierarchies or designs. There's always going to be some type of, of hierarchy. And, and like I said, I've said it many times before. That's why we have to look at a line of evidence that is going to be able to um, differentiate the, the, uh, the, two, the two models. Um, is it okay if I if I go to the speciation question or but take yeah I, I just want to I just want to once again say I, I don't like the use of the word prediction because nested hierarchies have been known long long before any of these people in the intelligent design movement came about. It's like me going to a football game, watching the game, coming out and saying I bet Lionel Messi is going to score three goals after having just watched him do it. It's it's not a prediction. It's an ad hoc ration, uh, rationale. One thing so, I. Yeah. That's just one thing I wanted to. Uh, one thing, say standing for truth. Before uh, I'll give you a chance to respond, standing for truth. But I just want to quick jump in and say first, I forgot to mention at the start, folks, that I have put all of our speakers' links in the description. So highly encourage you if you're listening and you're like, "Hmm, I like that." Well, you can hear plenty more by clicking on those links that I put in the description. Also, just want to let the speakers let you guys know that. Maybe uh, pretty soon we'll probably go to Q and A. So I'll, I'll kick it back over to you, Standing for Truth, if you want to respond. But maybe I would say if you guys are ready, uh, especially because if I remember right, Adam, you might have to get up in the morning or you want to get to, to sleep by a decent time. So I, 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 unfortunately, I don't work at the moment because coronavirus won't let me. So I'm unlimited in my time. You bet. Okay, gotcha. Well, I'm I'm pretty uh, you know unlimited on my time as well. So if you guys want to go for you know. We can go longer than usual if you guys want to go for like another like 15, 20 minutes and then Q&A. Yeah, maybe do um, a strict 15 minutes of discussion more and then q and I, I would like to go all night, but I've put my kids down for a nap for the debate. And it's, once we come up the two-hour mark, they're probably going to get up and that's going to be an issue. So Barge in there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you Barge in there. My daughter, okay. who's four, if you want to debate her, Adam, we can set that up. <laughs> <laughs> very sassy. All right. Thanks very <laughs> much. Kidding. Go ahead, Steady for Truth. Okay, awesome. You know what? I am tempted to go into like convergent evolution and all the uh, detailed inconsistencies and lines of evidence that uh, show a lack of uniqueness in, in the phylogenetic tree, but it would probably just take up the in, in the rest of the 15 minutes when I do want to get to uh, more of a, uh, I think an important line of evidence that, that can show um, biblical kinds in regards to speciation. So, um, if, if we move, so let's say we moved to, to species, okay? Um, yeah, sure. We, we do um, make predictions, very specific predictions, not only on the DNA function, uh, for example, but also in, in mutation rates, but also, and you can see these in print, Adam, but also on, um, like I said, spe uh, speciation rates. So even if we look at the 30 or so species of, of cats alive today, well, um, just to keep it simple, that would make prediction uh, it would make a prediction that uh, cats, for example, have been forming at a certain number of species per year, um, or it takes, you know, this many years, for example, to form a new species on average, according to our model. Um, and, and that's why we've made very specific uh, predictions on speciation rates, that, that, that species are continuously um, Forming, And you admitted that the evolutionists can't really make those types of uh, predictions. Um, but the thing is, we, uh, we have, we've made them on birds, for example, and you can look and, and we've got the numbers here, you can look, there's about 11,000 uh, or 12,000 bird species alive today on, on the planet. So um, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has, has made a prediction that if we, um, if we take this observation and, and um, predict that since the time of Noah's Ark, there's been about, you know, three to four new species on average per year. Um, we should be able to see new bird species forming today. Um, and, and that prediction works out because if, if you see, if so let's say there's 11,000 bird species on the planet today. That's about 4,500 years since the flood. Um, and of course, uh, if you do the math, that's... Um, 4,500 years since the flood, three or four bird species a year would actually work out um, 
perfectly if you just if you do the math. And those predictions are in print. But we've actually seen just this past year on the Galapagos Islands, Darwin's finches, for example, they've been studying for a number of years. New species, Adam, have actually been uh, observed and those results have been published. And those species were formed in exactly the same way that Dr. Nathaniel Jensen predicted that they would be formed. For example, shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity. Um, and then this this subpopulation of finches broke away. It was a breakaway population. They've become genetically distinct enough to be considered a new species. And that was observed in real time. So three to four species a year to account for the 11,000 species in 4,500 years is not a huge stretch since predictions are coming true on it. Take your time. What about the Sphenodon, of which there are only two surviving species? So there's two species today. How many speciation rates? What's the speciation rate of them? Uh, what, what, well, I, so are you going to, is the bird, but before I answer that, is the bird species prediction, is, is that consistent? Because like, it sounds like you just want to jump to another. Uh, In order for your conclusion to be valid, every single kind, as you want to call them, has to be consistent with that model. Right. Okay, so we'd have to look at the amount of species. That, so you're saying there's two of these species? Well, yes. we have dead ends of branches all the time. Just because some some new species pops up like a chihuahua and it will die out, and it, it's that does that's incorporated as well. It's just uh, there's going to be dead end, ends to branches all the time. But we're just talking about the overall speciation rate. The overall speciation rate. Yeah, like well, yeah, so of everything that wolves are speciating at a pretty constant rate, and then uh, we take that back. That's what's. Uh, that's what we would go by because wolves are the heirloom variety. We don't want to count dogs because they're like sheep. They're the domesticated form and we're, we're putting them in homes and we're breeding with them. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. I like the, the wolves. Are you taking extinction rate into account when you're coming up with these? Um, no, because of the mere fact that uh, most of the extinction is ha more happening recently with deforestation and how much we're messing up the environment. But since our model only goes back 4,300 years, there are going to be dead ends to branches, but we're just taking the overall, how many exist today, what their speciation rate number is, and then going back throughout the, the, the flood time as with, we're without, back. without knowing the extinction rate. Right. So you don't you don't know the extinction rate, so you're just going to assume that they didn't happen. Oh no, because the numbers still line up with what we're saying. So we, yeah, well, how do you know that if you don't know the extinction rate? No, there'll be definitely some dead ends and extinctions, but I mean overall, it's not going to really equate because that's why we see a little less snakes than there should be, right? Because remember, in our speciation model, if there's 1.2 a year, that means there should be about 5,220 snake species. But you you just said everything lines up. Right. And now, but, now you're saying that there's less than you'd expect to find. And right, yet you right. still haven't given me an approximate number of extinct, the extinction rate. There's a lot of vagueness around what you're saying. Yeah, but you see that the, the vagueness is there because the numbers are so trivial. We're only losing a, a couple thousand snakes. The numbers are your whole argument. How can, they, how can numbers be trivial when your entire argument is this times this equals this? Because the numbers are, again, they're very trivial. They're very small. The mistakes are just a little bit as where the numbers for evolution are huge. They're hundreds of thousands difference as where ours are a few thousand at most. Your whole argument is we look at the number of life today and we times that by this speciation rate, which we don't have any historical um, evidence for. We just go on today's rate equals number close to, I imagine you say completely accurate to the date of Noah's flood. Your whole argument rests on numbers and yet you're leaving numbers out. Correct. Well, again, oh, well, how about birds? They've tested birds, right? They found that it's what 3.3 new species of bird per year in Google and type up how many bird species there are. They, Do you think that number is consistent for 4,000 years? Yeah, it's a, the numbers are right in line. But if evolution was true, no, birds, no, no, what, what, what do you mean by in line? Uh, the numbers should be around 15,000 bird species around the world today, somewhere around that, from the ark, right? If Noah brought some birds on. And how many are there? Did, because he released a dove, so we know that birds were on the ark. So there if evolution was true and it was splits between dinosaurs, there should be hundreds of thousands of species. Hundreds of thousands. So, so you, how many birds are there alive today? You said 11,000. 
Uh, Google says around 10,000 species if you pull so it you, up. So you said you predict from, again, that word predict, from yeah. Noah's flood, there'll be 15,000. Correct. So it doesn't match up. No, it's a little bit higher, actually. But I bet you they'll find more. It's, it's two thirds. That's a significant amount. Well, Google says ten thousand. You can you can assume maybe there's some that haven't been discussed. I mean, you I, could say roughly eleven yeah. or twelve thousand. It, it, do, it does line up to, and and Matt's question has has to do with if birds evolved from dinosaurs millions and millions of years ago, and yet all we see is between ten and we can we can put a higher number on and say between 10 and 15,000, which is more consistent with uh, young earth creation, speciation predictions. How do you explain that? How do you explain that, Adam? Uh, I, I don't want you to go past the fact that you start an argument saying that there was, we expected this number of birds and that's how many birds you have. Now you're saying, oh, we expected this, but they, would, they only have two thirds of that. It's very, it being very vague here. And what I said earlier, it has to be consistent for everything. Well, absolutely everything and you still haven't given me extinction rate so when i brought up the sphenodon which only has two surviving species does that mean there's only been a speciation rate of one every two thousand years i'm not sure on those snakes sorry I, that, it's I, not a snake what oh what is it it's it's, uh, it's the tuatara tuatara damn i yeah they, those are specific when i was looking for the speciation rates i went to the general overboard like all snakes all bats all lizards all birds and because Noah brought more than one variety of bird, obviously he didn't bring the hawk and it speciated to all different things. He brought multiple. It says the hawk, the raven, the dove. There's multiple different varieties of birds that were on that ark. So that's why the numbers, I think, are going to be higher than the 10,000, what Google's talking about. I think they'll find a lot more. But you, you said that the mass agrees with you. And then when I push you on what the extinction rate is, you say you just don't know. If you want to operate in the field of maths, then you need to know the numbers. I'll add that for you then. To my book, how's that? I'll find out the extinction rates. Okay, <laughs> okay. When you've done that, I'd like to see it. Okay. Um, so, es essentially, what what we found out here is that y you've taken a couple of examples. Say, for instance, birds. You said we have this number of birds, and we'd expect that because we believe that he had hawks and doves on the ark, which you haven't given evidence for why he brought specific ones on. I mean, he says the dove, but didn't say anything about a hawk, as far as I'm concerned. Eliminated the need for uh, an extinction number, which can vary. You've, you've eliminated the possibility of variety throughout. You've said we have this mutation rate now, but that it doesn't exist in the past 4,000 years. There's all sorts of number factors here that you're missing. Well, I didn't catch that last part. Uh, you said the speciation uh, rates... You, 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 you said to me that you assumed that the 1.2 speciation rate was consistent oh. for 4,000 years. Right. That was on the snakes, correct. That was just what I could find. Oh, yeah, yeah, snakes, yeah. 1.2 yeah, snakes, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to just find overall snakes. I wasn't just trying to find a species-specific one. I, wanted, I, I would like to know, like bats, for example. Bats are categorically much easier for people to find because they their iguana was worth money so they want to find out well how how fast do these species grow how what's the biggest most amount of money we can find <laughs> so they found 1240 species exist and speciation rates seem to be uh, like 3 to 5 years on average what we extrapolate do, do you do you agree that speciation is dependent on the environment yes and if the environment changes quite a lot then you'd expect the speciation rate to change. Yeah, sure. So in the space of 4,000 years, would there have been enough environmental changes to drastically change the number of speciation events? Oh, it drastically changed the, uh, uh, the human. Uh, well, remember, before the flood, we believe that the environment was different. So speciation rates number were higher. Yeah, we're talking, after the, we're talking after the supposed most, wasn't it? Right, right, exactly. So it was more consistent after. That's why everything dropped down dramatically in, in, in life extension, and then all of it kind of plateaued and remains the same. Like humans always tend to live, or should, around the same age, unless there's a mistake or some disease. Humans should be living around the same. But before that, it was, it was much so, easier. So, so taking bird examples, you'd expect the speciation of rates of birds to change over 4,000 years. I mean, not much, really. Just the same, really, as humans. I would imagine that the more species there are, the more they diversify, and then the more species they would get from them. 
obviously because the numbers are going to be growing. Yeah. Okay. So an overview of what we've discussed, the birds, 15,000 species is what you'd expect. We have 10,000. You admit that speciation rate can change. You don't give an extinction rate. I don't, I don't understand how this is an argument for you. There, there are so many missing pieces to this puzzle. Okay, let's I don't take understand it, how you can bring it forward. Let's take, for example, then that this uh, extinction level was um, quite high. It, we can erase the 5,000 and we're back down to actually 10, what the actual number that we do see is. Uh, I extrapolated 15,000 because I thought there would be a lot more based on there's being more bird kinds in the arc. So that's but why you haven't, I, you haven't established how many kinds there are for a start. Again, right. that's another number we're missing. How many kinds are on the arc? Right. It's okay. That's when we get into the DNA barcoding for uh, the birds. We're going to find it, have to find out exactly how many birds were on the arc. And that'll be good because now we can differentiate. We're going to be able to see that the hawk is a different kind of a bird than a dove. And the dove is a different kind of bird to a, a crow and a raven. They're, they were mentioned uh, throughout. Um, I think Job mentions the hawk and the raven. Uh, it says that in Genesis, it mentions the dove because obviously it was released by Noah. Uh, so we can we get it, but they're, they weren't specific. They didn't say, we brought this mini on the ark. Uh, I wish they would if they would have made our job today a lot easier. <laughs> but I didn't know that we'd be, they probably didn't know we'd be getting questioned like this. So. Yeah, the whole, um, again, it, again, it comes back to DNA barcoding and that's another impasse. Uh, well, how about um, how about in vitro fertilization? If you could take a lizard and, and fertilize it with a snake, that would show us that they are the same kind. But that doesn't really happen. Same thing what happens with chimps and humans. I mean, there was a guy named Ilya Zonoviev or something in Russia. He was a Soviet biologist, and he was a world famous for artificial insemination. And in 1910, he was given permission by the World Congress zoologist that said, you can make a human ape hybrid. Now, he's world famous. He was the first person to create a horse zebra hybrid. I think it was called a Zorses. And he, he, can, he can do anything with them. He said, if anybody on earth exists that can make this thing, it's me. So they, they wanted to create a new uh, a soldier, a super soldier that was a, a mix between an ape and a man that they could give a gun and go kill people. So he did this for years. As a matter of fact, he took three female chimpanzees and artificially inseminated them with human sperm, bypassing their outer egg and directly into the zygote. He failed on every experiment he did. Because they're not the same are, are you saying then that um, you, you mentioned in vitro fertilization? Are you saying that kinds are creatures that can't reproduce with each other? Uh, cr yeah, th that would be the separation. Uh, for yeah, exactly. That's one. So, of so that would defi that defines kinds for you: the lack of ability to reproduce. One of them, yes. Yeah, ours. Is, uh, uh, do you agree then with Standing's previous definition, which was uh, descent from the same gene pool? Right. Well, that, that's what I mean. If, if, if the same gene pool would be for a snake and a lizard, then they would be able to in vitro be fertilized and we would have to now say, OK, they are related. And now we have the, to the, the ability to reproduce is depending on similarity between genomes. We know that gene genomes diverge as the generations go by. So eventually they will not be able to reproduce. So therefore, there would be different kinds. I I didn't get the question. Sorry. So you said that it's down to whether they're able to reproduce. Right. And that is an ex and that coincides with being in the same gene pool. We know that gene pools change over time. Between in, it, between generations, between people. So over time, gene pools will diverge. So eventually they won't be able to reproduce anymore. So there's but a contradiction in your in your because they'd be from the same gene pool, but they wouldn't be able to reproduce anymore. For example, all humans are able to reproduce because it's mankind. It's the overall. If we were related to apes, which are in the same species according to evolution, then we should be able to in vitro force a a, a hybrid out of the two. Same thing with uh, what we do with donkeys. We can hybridize something out of them. We can we can cross all horses because all horses are related. But if dogs and seals were related, then we should be able to cross them to some degree and get a some kind of an offspring. We can hybridize them. We could in vitro. We can pass up the, the form of the egg that might make it impossible for under normal circumstances between the two mating. Did you know there's a theory that believes that pigs mated with chimps to create humans? That's the newest theory in evolution right now. 
I have I have not heard of that, yeah. and I um, I don't even think I should need to comment on that. That sounds patently ridiculous, and I don't know where you've got that from, and I don't know why that's being stapled to evolutionary biology. I've never heard of it. I've never seen it in the in the um, in the literature. I don't know where you've got that from. But genomes change. Oh, uh, if I could make a suggestion, j uh, just so we have enough time for a good Q and A, James, could we maybe give Adam <clears throat> a couple minutes to wrap everything up, and then give me and Matt just two minutes to wrap everything up and jump into a, a, a Q and A? We usually jump from the open conversation. Given that, unless you guys had wanted closing statements, we could jump right into the Q and A because right now the stream, I'm really thankful and surprised we've made it this far because my connection over here has been really weak. And so thanks so much for everybody listening. Hopefully at least the audio has made it through. I think it's frozen a bit on the video, but it sounds like generally the audio made it through, which is great. I want to say thanks so much for being here to our guests. The debaters, the guests are the lifeblood of the channel. So we can't thank them enough as it's just a joy to get to listen to them. Thanks so much guys for being here. Awesome guys, we're here. We're here this afternoon um, with Adam Heat, Raw Matt, and myself. Of course, we are uh, continuing the discussion with uh, Adam Heap. Um, so I want to thank him for uh, joining us this evening. Um, if you haven't seen our first um, talk, more of a formal debate on uh, modern day debate on uh, generally the same topic of ancestry, uh, universal common ancestry, or I guess you could call it biblical uh, limited ancestry. Uh, I definitely recommend checking that out. This is going to be more of an informal dialogue, uh, touching on maybe some of the loose ends or, or some of the, the topics from the first uh, dialogue that we'd want to elaborate on more. Uh, Adam always makes for a good discussion. He's, uh, from my understanding, he's- That's a lie, by the way. <laughs> hey, you paid me to say that. Now you, you can't, can't prove that. that. Prove me the scientific <laughs> study that says that I have a good discussion. <laughs> can't find anything. All right, I'll, I'll I'll accept correction on that one. Uh, from my understanding, Adam's got a background in uh, zoology. I think he's he's also uh, has a background in herpetology. Um, actually, did you did, did you want to clarify that, Adam? Or I have a, a master's degree in zoology and herpetology. Herpetology being primarily the study of reptiles and amphibians, but I I. You know, amphibians are bleh, are more into the reptile side, me. <laughs> the cool side. Yeah, the cool side, yeah. Well, that being said, we always enjoy talking with Adam because he's certainly qualified and well-educated, and he's looked over a lot of the material that Raw Matt and myself have put out. So he uh, yeah, he, he brings forth good uh, arguments and, and good objections, which, uh, you know, gets us all to think. And and like I said before, it leads to a good, memorable um discussion so once again thanks uh guys for joining us um, i'll pass it off to uh adam heap and raw matt as well if you guys <coughs> have a couple short introductions and then we'll do we'll jump right into uh, a couple uh, related topics to ancestry uh, i'm happy to have my introduction as a simple yet tangential question and that is why is so much as community canadian Oh, are you saying because your intro is going to lead in with the question? Do you want Matt? No, to... that's just it. I don't have an intro. So that my intro is just a tangential question that I've always wondered. Why are yeah. there so many Canadians in this bloody community? <laughs> Where did they all come from? <laughs> Where did we all come from, Canadians? Hey. Yeah. Canadians produce Canadians, my friend. <laughs> oh, but at, at one point, they, can't, they weren't Can Canadians. No, that's true. We, we could probably trace, uh, I can probably trace my um, Canadian-ness, I guess you can call it, right back to Adam and Eve, maybe. What do you think, Matt? They were well, you're American, Matt. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, Canada's above us and they're bigger, so I'll leave them alone. Oh, you know, I was, <laughs> I was working on the map yesterday. I was doing some work in my brother's house. He's getting his floors done and he's got this big picture of, you know, the map. Um, it, it, it's not flat. Sorry, guys. But okay. I was looking at the, the country sizes, you know, and, and, and sometimes when you glance at it, if, if it's been a while, I mean, the size of Russia or the size of like Canada, too, even in comparison to like the states or so Matt, Don't mess, brother. 
That's true, but I, I think all those maps are fake news. So. <laughs> I heard the other day that the last place on Earth to ever be discovered was actually Antarctica. Which is probably quite hard to believe, considering the tiniest little islands that you get in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans that were found before the whole of Antarctica. Yeah, that is interesting, actually. Well, Adam, you, you're always welcome to come visit in Canada. We've got really good coffee. Um, you know, we're pretty easy going to talk to. Uh, yeah, you've, got, you've got to provide me a source for all this, by the way. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess. I guess getting into it then, did you, um, just to start it off, if, if we're going into Ancestry, um, and if not, you know, not putting you on the spot, but we uh, discussed uh, Mitochondrial Eve a, a great deal in the first discussion, yep. as well as uh, why chromosome atom. Mm -hmm. You did bring up a very interesting study um, done in Chinese men, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that, actually, just to kind of uh, get the audience up to date? From what I recall from that paper, it was essentially two Chinese men, 13 generations apart. And they measured the amount of differences in the, uh, the mitochondrial DNA. So essentially, they added it all up. They saw where the common ancestor between the two was, which was about 1805. And it was a, it was a case of simple multiplication, essentially. Was this the one? That I that think was, they, yeah, that's the Y chromosome. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Just clarifying. Yeah. So that that's it. The problem that they got a mutation rate, which, which aligned with the human chin split of between four, five and nine million years. Right. So I think in in that in, in that portion we were going over um, how we can look at like mitochondrial DNA, for example, and and I know mm -hmm. that there's been several papers. Um, looking at that, you know, mutation rate and, and coming up with a date for Eve. Um, mm -hmm. We were pointing out the fact that, I mean, not only does the mitochondrial DNA go back to three major groupings, which we can get into later, that we would say are the three uh, daughters-in-law of, of Noah, um, but the mitochondrial DNA itself, um, you know, goes back just uh, 6,000 years to... Um, you know, a, a one single female ancestor, but with the Y chromosome, you're saying you're saying based on on this study, um, e even though the uh, Y chromosomes in in the world today, like when we actually focus, let's say on the variation of it, um, the Y chromosomes have very little variation, right? But based on that Chinese study, and based on the mutation rates in that study, it takes the Y chromosomal ancestor back like two hundred thousand years. Um, as expected by the evolution model, right? Yeah. Can I just apologize for my coughing, by the way? Just some coughing. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. <laughs> so, were you continuing your point there, or no? No, I, I was just I was just clarifying your point that uh, given the empirical method on mitochondrial DNA, mm -hmm. and given the empirical method on the Y chromosome. DNA, you're saying there's a contradiction there. Yeah, so I'm saying if, you, if you're if you going to say that the mutation rate in the mitochondrial DNA, simple multiplication, uh, constant rate, brings us back to roughly, what was it, 6,000 years? Um, then I don't see what your problem is. When we do exactly the same process with Y chromosome, which brings us back several thousand, uh, several hundred thousand years. And then, um, because I, I typically say that we look at the entire genetic structure as a whole, which speaks to us of a literal Adam and Eve, and you rightfully point to the Y chromosome variation and the mutation rate as um, expounded upon in, in, in that specific paper. Like, I know there was two initial papers. Um, one in, I think it's in 2009 is the one you're referring to with the Chinese men. And, is that yeah, right? I think, yeah, 2009, yeah, I think it's that, yeah. And then they did another one in 2015, um, 
Actually, before I cover those papers, so and so in our first discussion, I, I pointed uh, you to a paper. I, I can um, send it to you again after this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I think I sent it in the comment section, so that that could be the miscommunication. But um, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, he looked um, he looked at the Y chromosome, and he looked at um, all these. I think it's four, four or five papers that that are out on the Y chromosome, and and he concluded. Um, empirically that we only observe 4,500 years of mutation accumulation in the parental ancestry uh, contained in, in that record of, of the human <clears throat> chromosome. Did you, actually, have you is read this, any of the, is, is it just a, 2009 paper you read, Adam, or was it all, or was it all of them? I think it was 2009. Can I ask, um, the point you're talking about now, is it the one, because I've read parts of your, your 100 plus falsifications book, is it, is it that one that's covered in one of the first few bits? I don't think so, because the um, Nathaniel the Jensen Y chromosome paper was just recent. I'm not sure if we've added it to the book. Uh, Matt, can you clarify that? I did, but it's not the first one. The first one focuses on mtDNA rates, and then the Y chromosome that's rates are <clears throat> much later. Yeah. That's something I wanted to bring up at some point. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. So I, I would just say uh, to break it down for the audience too, when it comes to the Y chromosome, you know, all we do in the easiest way is we just take father and son, and then we count how many mistakes occur each generation. This is the empirical method, right? Mistakes happen every generation. Uh, the question is, how many? Is it, is it every generation? Is it every few generations? We don't really know until we get. Uh, say dad's Y chromosome, you know, son's Y chromosome, grandfather's Y chromosome, and and do an, an analyses and then measure the rate of, of mistakes. So as Adam pointed out, you know, they did an initial study in 2009 with the Chinese med and another one in 2015. And Dr. Jensen covers this in his most recent paper. Now those first two studies, they were based on low quality uh, data and low quality DNA sequencing. So the results that were concluded are what um, Adam, Adam uh, described. He's right on that, that the rate of mutations that were discovered were slow, which met the expectations of, of the 200,000 years um, for the evolutionary Y chromosomal atom. But um, the important thing is that they did two additional studies, one in 2000. Uh, 15 and another in 2017. Those ones, though, those were based on high quality DNA. And what they discovered, which is fascinating, actually, um, I recommend reading the paper. Um, there's a ton of good sources in it, too. Um, they discovered that um, in, in, the, in the supplemental material, so you're going to have to look at the details of this paper, um, but that the number of father to son Y chromosome differences was actually approximately tenfold higher than previously discovered and expected from the first two papers. So, and, and they readily admit this as well in, in the paper. And they even admit that those empirical findings uh, urge them to explore uh, additional filters. I've got the quote here from the paper too. So in, in other words, they, they took their high quality DNA results and filtered stuff out that doesn't fit their evolutionary time scale. But the point is, is, is the, the, those subsequent studies, Adam, that was based on high quality DNA uh, sequencing on the Y chromosome demonstrates a Y chromosome atom consistent you, with how, younger creation. How are you distinguishing high quality from low quality DNA? Um, in, in this in the study, um, Dr. Jensen, well, I mean, these studies where they look at the high quality DNA in like the actual uh, secular sources, um, they explain their methodology. They explain, I guess, the, the high quality DNA versus the low quality DNA from the initial study in 2009 and 2015. Um, they readily admit that it is, um, you know, there is a difference in, in those findings. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, what, what, what I mean is, are you saying that if something's considered low quality DNA, does that mean that mutation rate is different? It, it just, it, it may. How, what does it mean regarding mutation rates, basically? So if, if it's lower quality DNA, then the uh, mutation rate derived from it could be off. That's why it is good to look at if, 
if your first study, let's say on the Y chromosome in 2009, all they had was a low quality DNA, that's really the best that they're going to have at that point in time. But as time goes on, if you get additional studies where now they've got higher quality DNA and all of a sudden they can look at it better than the low quality DNA. Um, I mean, that's kind of just a, a fact of, of science. So, right? Do you, what you're saying is that low quality DNA somehow has different mutation rates to high quality DNA or less consistent mutation rates from high quality DNA? Because I, what, the whole point of this is that we're just measuring mutation rates. So what difference does it make if it's supposedly high quality or low quality? Well, the high or the low quality DNA that was looked at in 2009 can come up with inconsistent results. So yeah, you're right. They just take, you know, father and son, and then they count how many mistakes occur each generation. Every time there's a mistake, there's a new branch in the family tree. Take those branches back to one male <laughs> and how long ago is the question? Well, the low quality DNA sequencing um, had inconsistent results that were uh, consistent with the 200,000 years for Adam that you're talking about. But in the subsequent studies, the high quality DNA demonstrated that this Y chromosome Adam lived just actually 4,500 years ago, uh, Dr. Jensen proves. And, and they admit this in the paper, like their exact, um, their exact quote here um, in, in the paper. And I believe you'll have to find it in the uh, supplemental material. They say the number of father to son Y chromosome differences was approximately tenfold higher than the expected number. Considering the range of published Y chromosome copying mistake rates, this finding prompted us to explore additional filters. So they did explore, you know, additional filters in, in explaining the data. But Dr. Jensen just took that observed mutation rate in the Y chromosome based on the empirical method. And he... Um, he discovered that this Y chromosome ancestor only lived about 4,500 years ago, which would actually be our nearest Y chromosome ancestor, which would be Y chromosome Noah. I'm not familiar with any study that says four, four and a half thousand years. The, the minimum date, uh, the minimum time backwards that Y chromosome is supposed to have dated is about 60,000 years, and that's the lowest estimate. I uh, still... I mean, we're going to have to move on from this. Because yeah, I yeah, I don't, I don't want to stick on I'm, one. I'm, I'm finished. Um, I don't think we're going to get through to the difference between low quality and high quality because I'm assuming that you think that the low quality and high quality must have both been there from the beginning. So surely it doesn't matter if they're high, low quality mutation rates. But from well, what you say, say should be consistent. I would just say the high quality DNA gives a better and more consistent mutation rate. And it's, it, it is also consistent with uh, creationist predictions and actually uh, evolutionist expectations on the decay of the Y chromosome. I know Matt touched on that um, in, in our uh, first dialogue. Matt, did you want to jump in here and, and touch on that? So uh, the, the Y chromosome is degrading and accumulating mutations at a rate higher than, um, for example, I think even the like mitochondrial DNA. Like it is literally... Um, tenfold, as they say, tenfold higher than expected. Uh, Matt, did you want to touch on that? Sure, yeah, but for uh, Adam here, I pulled up the um, the study, and here's how they discovered it. Basically, what it is is they said that they filtered variant sites and found that uh, a complete genomic study only kept the uh, allelic SNPs and VQ high. I don't know what that's <laughs> For, but it's a, a it basically has to pass a score to be 95 percent or better so the y chromosome that they had before was of lower quality meaning what they say in the study is the human y chromosome is known to have large segments of sequences that are difficult to map until now so basically they had a smaller segments of the y chromosome not a complete uh, genomic. now they have 95 percent or more of the y chromosome and it's high quality so they can get a more accurate um study our trio study they can they can see it better so that's why they got a faster mutation rate jensen's the one that mapped it out and found four thousand five hundred years now it, it, actually real quick adam before you talk so is it as easy as um the high quality uh dna that was um discovered or, or used is just a, a a higher range of um testing a higher range of samples to compare versus the low quality uh, dna matt 
Oh, you're asking me. I saw. I thought you were asking Adam something. Well, I'm just trying to break it down for the audience <laughs> in a more easier way to understand. Is that is um, in a layman way of understanding? Is that what it is? There's just a better range of, of testing and comparisons on the Y um, chromosome DNA in the the higher quality. Right. Version. Exactly. They tested. They tested uh, not just more people. They kept testing the Y chromosome database and kept compiling more segments until they had a more complete Y chromosome. Right, right. Yeah. It was just like adding on to the original. Exactly. So how much, when Nathaniel Jensen did this study, how much of the mitoco mitochondrial genome was tested? I think this one uh, wasn't uh, the mitochondria at all. I think it was just the Y chromosome. Oh, the Y, sorry, y, that's what I mean, right? Y chromosome. Yeah, that's all he was looking at for the study. Um, I posted a video on our channel of it. it uh, unfortunately, it was kind of vague. He said it is in his book, though. Uh, so I can get you the specifics on that after. I, I didn't research it out. Okay. Now, if, if we want, we can just move on. Yeah, I just wanted to show that, um, like, in the mitochondrial DNA and how the empirical method, um, you know, determines that, this mitochondrial ancestor lived just 6,500 years ago or so, and that she, you know she would be the one female ancestor of, of all people. And, and I, I don't want to straw man the evolutionists. I know that they believe that you know Eve and, and Adam were uh, part of a population, but that's a separate argument, possibly for a separate day to not bog down. I was, down I, was to, um, I was going to ask. The, the general consensus is that even if it was dated to 6,000 years, that doesn't mean that should be the first should be part of a population. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. I mean, we could discuss that now. The thing is, the out of Africa scenario involving the, the population bottleneck has some really, really significant problems with it. Um, I mean, it was actually the low genetic diversity uh, that was discovered in, in the human uh, genome, right? We're all 99.9% .9 similar. Um, that's incredibly low. So they, and you probably know this, they invented the um, hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck to explain the low um, genetic homogeneity, right? They had to reduce the population. But the thing is that population bottleneck, Adam, and you can comment on this as well, um, that would have, um, it would have been at a near extinction level. It would have um, occurred for a prolonged period of time and it would have resulted in a severe loss of, um, genetic diversity corresponding to the fixation of bad mutations and severe inbreeding depression. That's the problem. So this inbreeding would have occurred for not one generation, not two generations, but three or thousands of, of generations. So that so-called hypothetical population bottleneck of two or 10,000 people would have been so um, genetically compromised that my question to you, Adam, uh, regarding it is how could such a small nearly extinct, as I said, genetically compromised population such as that suddenly explode into all parts of the planet, seizing dominion over the world in order to make Adam and Y chromosome Adam coming from a population even feasible. I'm not familiar with the studies on it, nor any of the science behind it. So if I were to give you any answer, it would be purely off the top of my head. Uh, is the question essentially how do we get from such a low number to the amount of people we have today? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I, well, I'm pretty much saying that that out of Africa um, population bottleneck would have been so um, severely genetically damaged based on the accumulation of mutations from inbreeding, right? Those mutations, those recessive mutations would have come to the forefront. We can see how implausible that is just by looking at the uh, looking at the cheetahs of the world today, we know that they're down to like six or seven thousand due to pr uh, prolonged inbreeding. So it's gone on for you know so many generations that there's been so many uh, bad mutations that have uh, been fixated. So their sperm is is degenerate. Conservationists are incredibly worried about the cheetah, and we're not going to see the cheetah suddenly explode in all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet. But uh, that's what they say occurred in this out of Africa scenario. So I understand that that's the hypothesis. I'm just saying that there's a lot of problems um, associated yeah, with. Okay, that. Yeah. So, so you're saying there's a problem with, say, if the population is down to 10,000, that would cause severe problems. How then do you explain? everybody coming from firstly two people 6,000 years ago and then four and a half thousand roughly years ago coming from essentially one bloke 
essentially, essentially one because you can remove the first one. The bottleneck is the latest. Oh yeah, I'm just saying that there's there's bottlenecks involved in uh, your out of Africa scenario, and then also our our scenario. The pro the, the, the thing is with our our bottleneck. So you got the, the bottleneck at creation of two, and then you've got the bottleneck at the flood of eight, I believe it is, and then the Tower of Babel. So three essentially, you know, uh, bottlenecks. The thing is, um, all of them were not prolonged. They were uh, just one generation, and each bottleneck was followed by exponential population growth and also also we explain the vast majority of dna differences as pre-existing functional dna differences as compared to the evolutionist that explains the um the vast majority if not all the uh, dna differences as a role, result of mutation over time so the first I one put, I, 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 I put in there it doesn't matter what was originally put into because essentially you have alleles and if you've only got four people then you've got four different alleles that's the entirety of variation so, so you, you say that there's this created massive amount of variation but if you've only got four people then you've only got four alleles potentially right so actually that is a good question i'm kind of glad that you brought that up so um that argument technically comes down to the question how do we define an allele so if if, if an allele is defined in terms of a gene unit then um, yeah, you're right. Then generating allelic diversity by saying you know mutating <clears throat> one gene per per event, mutational event, that would produce um, almost no diversity. But the thing is, an allele should be defined as a single genomic position. Okay, Adam, and that means that that allele is independent of its relationship to a gene. So that means enormous allelic diversity can be generated um, not only by mutation, but uh, also by you know genetic uh, processes such as uh, recombination um, and gene conversion, for example. Let me let me break it down for you. Okay, yeah, so that's how, that's how evolution happens. Right, right, but um, evolution has to explain. Well, here I just want to break this down real quick, even for the audience, because um, a lot of that's technical. A single gene, okay, so it typically <laughs> spans thousands of nucleotides and single nucleotide variants might be distributed throughout that gene, okay? Um, let's say, for example, maybe at 90 of the nucleotides within the gene. So if, if we um, take the genomic position definition of allele, then um, let's use the animals at um, the flood in the ark. Every single one of those um, single nucleotide variants could have existed in a heterozygous state in each of the individuals of the pairs brought on board the ark. And then at creation, we know that God created and bought. But I guess going back to the um, the out of Africa and then our bottleneck, yeah. So ours is one generation, no accumulated mutations. So there's no inbreeding problem because inbreeding involves the uh, exposing or, or the uh, coming to the forefront of the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. But if there is no genetic mistakes, as our model would suggest, then there wouldn't be um, any any inbreeding or uh, genetic bottleneck problem. But for you, uh, like how would you explain it? If you have all these mutations coming to the forefront for not just one generation, not two generations, but thousands of generations, how did this incredibly genetically compromised uh, population of two or 10,000 um, leave Africa, explode in all parts of the world and then seize dominion over, over the planet? Like, is there any feasible way of, of that occurring? I don't know, I haven't looked at the papers. Yeah, no, and that's fine. I'd like to refer you to someone who's actually looked at that stuff because I haven't looked at it. I know. Yeah, I wasn't planning on that. I've had like full debates on that exact topic. I'm, I'm fascinated with the out of Africa story. We can just, um, I was just answering. I, I, I don't like to straw me in the evolutionists. I know that they say that the Y chromosome Adam and the mitochondrial Eve, you know, were part of a, a population, but I'm just saying that that. Um, that idea is not really supported by the scientific evidence because you'd have to explain how that would even be remotely feasible. Plus, if, if these two ancestors is showing here based on Y chromosome and mitochondrial mutation rates and variation lived just 6,500 years ago, then we should have plenty of evidence, even in written records of, of some kind of out of Africa type uh, scenario. But I, I know you had a question as well about the Y chromosome in, in the book that you wanted to direct at Matt or... I, want to give uh, I, just, I, just wanna, I, I don't want to move on too far from what we're talking because I do want to say that you're saying that my problem is that I had a gen genetic bottleneck of around 10,000 people. 
but you, you seem to shrug off the idea that you've got a bottleneck of essentially four people because you've got Noah and his sons who are all derived from him, so he's the bottleneck. So Noah and three women. So you're saying I've got a problem with ten thousand people, so many thousands of years ago, but you haven't got a problem in less time with many with much less people. So if you're going to give me these problems, you've got to take the problems as well. And when we talk about genetic bottlenecks, it's not just about mutations. It's also about immunity to, to parasites and bacteria. Because if there's only so many people, then what if a virus comes along and infects? If they've all got very similar genes, then they're, they're screwed, essentially. And if we're going to look at this realistically, if you've got four people, then you've got a maximum of four varieties of each allele. I mean, I know you've talked that very vague terms about heterozygosity when it comes to, I you lost me a bit with that but are you do genes come about via mutation do we get new varieties of genes well we can get well i'm just saying that to, to go back to the allele i'm just saying if you define an allele as a uh, single genomic position independent of its relationship to a gene which is the way it should be um, define, then I'm just saying producing variety according to our created heterozygosity hypothesis wouldn't be a problem. And also when it comes to um, like the genetic bottlenecks, well, real quick, I just want to address your points. I'm trying to remember what you said. So with the viruses, um, for one, viruses are beneficial. I mean, you have trillions and trillions and trillions of viruses in and on your body, Adam. You actually have more viruses than you do bacteria and cells, and they're all beneficial. They help regulate the number of species of bacteria in and on your body. Uh, in the environment and ecosystems, viruses help regulate bacteria, for example, in the ocean as well. Endogenous retroviruses we know are highly functional. So mutation and genetic entropy over time, it, it, this all comes back to the, the genetic entropy model. Um, Adam, because if we started with no mutations at creation with Adam and Eve, and we started with genomes that were front loaded with genetic diversity, there's not going to be any inbreeding problems, not only for that reason, but as I explained, the population bottlenecks were only one generation, okay, one generation at the at creation, one generation at the flood, and they both were followed by rapid and exponential population growth. So for one, very little of that original created genetic diversity would be lost uh, because the, the bottlenecks were only one generation each. But, but the problem with your model is all those DNA differences anyways, you explain as mutation. Okay. And yeah, like recombination and gene conversion can produce new chromosomal combinations. That's true. I wouldn't say any new genes, but new combinations, new traits can come about through this process. But if our DNA differences are already built in, they're created functional DNA differences, that means new varieties can be created rapidly. Every single generation, especially in, in uh, creation, in the pre-flood world, I mean, speciation events would have been far uh, faster and more frequent than um, today. So I think it just goes back to the created heterozygosity hypothesis and and genetic entropy that we we've talked about talked about that before. We're accumulating 100 new mutations per person per generation. Take that accumulating mutation problem, Adam, back to a point of least accumulated mutations. That would be a point of creation, a point of no genetic degeneration, no genetic mistakes, therefore no inbreeding problems in in that first uh, generation creation related bottleneck take your time i know i talked a lot there you you start to go into genetic entropy there which i think i talked about in the last one as being a very obscure scientific idea that's only put about in places like answers in genesis and this nathaniel jeanson who you you quote quite a lot i've looked at the literature and there's there's nothing about genetic entropy um and it's one of those things, as well as a lot of other things, like mutation rates. It's not just about some specific examples, like you say there's um, genetic degradation in humans. It has to be across the board. Absolutely everything needs to line up with this. And that's not what we see. Well, the thing is, is they found that uh, mitochondria and different things does have different rates, for example, in reptiles and 
birds, it's extremely fast and it's slower than others. They haven't actually determined a universal clock. They found that some things have faster clocks because they have <clears throat> And shorter lifespans or some will have a faster clock because their metabolism is extremely fast they haven't exactly figured out the total correlation yet but um standing for truth is going crazy with the science i just would say that here's a logical question uh if you just do the math evolution says that a, a bottleneck that happened two hundred thousand years ago there were supposedly between five and fifteen thousand women so if you cut that in average that's ten thousand different people or 30,000 individuals. Now let's say that if those half were women, again, 10,000, that's the average, but yet we only have one today, right? One line of mtDNA. That means that 9,999 women either had to die or birth to girls for that to happen. So it seems kind of improportionate considering evolution said, no, there were plenty of other women. There were thousands. Sorry for my cough. <laughs> The you do not do, do you not think that they could be part of a population though? Well, the population the that they, all the descendants of say one person could end up dominating the entire population, or at least the, the all of the members of the population that we've tested. Okay, here let me, I'm going to try and break it down real quick, and then Matt, I don't want to jump in on your time, but um, okay, so it's as easy as this. So. Over over deep time, as evolution would uh, have us believe, is, is how we got all the species, all the change, of course, all the evolution. Um, any, any large population will accumulate massive numbers of mutations, okay? That is how the evolutionists explain the um, genetic diversity in not only humans, but animal species, for example. Now, uh, this becomes a, a very serious problem, Adam, for evolutionary theory, because we now know, as I indicated earlier, that the human species has very little genetic diversity. OK, so that observed low genetic diversity is not a problem for us because we expect that based on the biblical perspective. We came from just two people. God created Adam and Eve. What would we expect? Low genetic diversity. And that's what we see. Now, this was a huge problem for evolution from the evolution perspective, Adam, because um of the low genetic diversity if we've been accumulating all these numbers of mutations for millions of years in you know obviously there was uh, variable degrees of, of populations we shouldn't have this low genetic diversity so they came up with the hypothetical out of africa population bottleneck um i think they say maybe around seventy thousand years ago uh which was a, a near extinction event so those mutations that have been accumulating over time okay they've now come to the forefront those enormous numbers of deleterious mutations have gone to fixation now it's not one generation like our population bottlenecks followed by rapid exponential growth no this actually occurred for many generations that's the only way that they can explain the reduction in homo Geneity. But by the time that that population suddenly exploded out of Africa and all parts of the world, they would have been so severely genetically damaged that there's no feasible way. I get that it's a hypothesis. I'm just saying there's no feasible way that that could have taken place. Just look at the cheetahs today. They're down to 6,000 because of their population bottleneck. Their sperms degenerate. Conservationists are worried that they're going to go extinct. That's what happens in, in small bottleneck populations. So that's that's what we're saying. Yeah, That hypothetical population associated with Eve and Y chromosome Adam has some really, really, really theoretical issues that I haven't seen anybody deal with. There's, there's just a few points. Again, you've just bypassed the fact that your bottleneck is in a much worse position than mine, and your excuses are, as far as I'm concerned, baseless and nonsense. And not only if you, you, you take one example, humans, I'm not sure on the number that was around in this supposed bottleneck. I don't, I've looked, I haven't looked at any of those studies. So I can't, again, I can't really comment on that. But it's not just a one species thing. You've got to show trends. If you think that everything should have descended from creatures four and a half thousand years ago, everything needs to align with that. It's no good giving me a specific species that could have gone for a bottleneck roughly around that time. You've got to show a trend. It's got to be a universal thing. Well, you have to remember that it is a universal thing because, for example, um, as we say, Adam, God created two people, okay? So Adam and Eve. That means that Adam and Eve would have had differences DNA differences within themselves. 
And then, of course, the, this How'd idea. You know that? How do you know that? Well, I'm saying this is a hypothesis and testable predictions flow from it. That's when we, when we can get in. Because if God front-loaded Adam and Eve and, and all the kinds with uh, the front-loaded functional DNA differences, our prediction would be, okay, the more we sequence the genome, the more we look and study these DNA differences, we predict that the vast, vast majority of these DNA differences, DNA elements, right? For example, the jumping genes, the ERVs, the ALUs, the pseudogenes, these would all play a functional role in, in, in the species. Um, but I'm just saying that that's the testable prediction that flows from it. But real quick, I wanted to answer your question of, of universally. Well, uh, the fact that God encoded Adam and Eve with these front-loaded functional uh, DNA differences applies universally among species, okay? So, for example, each created kind, Adam, okay. was front-loaded with functional DNA differences that, as I've said before, through a variety of processes and mechanisms, such as, let's say, gene conversion, um, recombination, genetic drift, isolation, <laughs> migration, whatever, those DNA differences combined with those processes has led to the origin of species. Now, what do we see? Okay. So the Bible says God created animals in bulk. He didn't just create two like he did with Adam and Eve. So we should expect a higher genetic diversity in the animal kinds, in the animals seen around the world. And that's exactly what we see. And in humans, we see no genetic diversity consistent with that uh, hypothesis. Take your time. But every animal, well, at least every land dwelling animal was restricted to either two or seven. Right. Right. For Noah's so you're well, expecting everything, um, even less genetic diversity in everything that isn't human. So you'd expect surely smaller levels of diversity within animals, but that's, the, we well, see no, animals no. with incredible levels of diversity. I mean, just look at, I mean, we, we talked about cobras, and I, I hate to always bring up snakes, but their diversity is enormous, just in cobras. Yes, I agree. So here's here's the thing, though, okay? Um, all of this to say that the evidence does correlate with, and I understand your objection with the, the bottleneck of these kinds, and I'll explain that problem, too, or an answer to that problem. But this is all to say that the evidence does indicate that God created animals with a greater ability to diversify um, in, in other words, the original animal kinds were front loaded with more diversity than humans. And this makes sense since we know, as I said, God created populations of animal kinds and then only two humans, Adam and Eve. This is why we know the human race has low genetic diversity, which would suggest that we came from a small population. But not only that, like we talked about earlier, which is why it's so important when we combine the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome data, it wasn't just a small population. It was a population of just two, just as the Bible tells us, Adam and Eve. Now, at, at the bottleneck with the animals, because it was only one generation, and this is just basic science, too, when it comes to bottlenecks, very, very little of that created heterozygosity would have been lost because it was followed by rapid exponential growth. So what we see actually correlates perfectly with this hypothesis. Plus, Matt was explaining in the last debate that that study with the DNA barcoding, it proves that over 90% of all life originated at the same time based on the genetic diversity seen in that CO1 gene in the mitochondria. So everything is correlating universally, as you said, uh, we should find. And that's exactly what we find. Can I just nip to the lab? I'll, it's my fault for drinking too much cappuccino. I'll be right back. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Right, cheers. <clears throat> yeah, once you get a scratch in your throat, it's so hard to clear out when you have to talk. It's It just gets worse. <laughs> Actually, that's a good time for an intermission for me, too. Matt, I'll let you... Uh, I know I've been talking a lot. I don't want to dominate the entire conversa conversation. You you take over for a few minutes I'll, for when he gets back. I'm going to run for a quick bathroom break, too. All right. Me and me and Praise. What's going on, Praise? <laughs> we got to entertain the audience. Uh oh, you're gone. Aren't you? No, I'm not. 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 <laughs> good conversation gonna, man good conversation loving it you're gonna think somebody's possessed on this channel someone just tuned in <laughs> Don't you uh, Matt, oh sorry i don't know because i know with what, what your question adam uh before we took our bathroom breaks i'm glad we're all back uh matt <coughs> with, with, with that study with the genetic diversity um that would indicate 
the uh, not the creation event, but the flood event, um, starting with all those animal kinds based on the diversity, correct? Exactly. That's what that sh that's what that event is actually showing. That's why there was so little barcode and gap between all life. Everything was very short because they expected evolution to be true. They di didn't expect to find any gaps really whatsoever. And uh, <coughs> the low diversity showed that all life was recent and and appeared at the same time. So you mentioned, am I allowed to get back into now? Are we already in, set to go? Sure. Yeah. So you, when you were talking there, you said that there's even more genetic diversity in at least the majority of animals, I, I suppose you implied, from fewer individuals coming off the ark. And you said it was because it was the one generational thing, they maintain that, the diversity, but that's not how genetics works. If, there are, if you're restricted to two individual animals, then you've got a maximum of two varieties of a gene. They don't, it's the whole point population doesn't get put into these two creatures it's restricted to two genotypes correct uh think about it like this um we say that things were on a family level so when noah went onto the ark he would have brought say a wolf and a fox and so all the species that we've seen since that time has the ability within those original wolf and fox that went on the ark to diversify into the species that we see today that's what that's what we say so birds yeah a lot more birds went on the ark um a lot more than horses would have probably one horse pair you know because look at how few there are and they species very how, how do you decide uh that's where we kind of get into trying to define what a kind is most of the time uh it's always been referred to as just something that can bring forth after its kind that's more uh, along the line of referring to noah and what went on the ark and we're trying to make it go even further back. So we're trying to incorporate DNA barcoding with the zygote fertilization and the um, uh, orphan genes. We try, we try to look more broad spectrum and see what we can actually look at to, to place into a, uh, something, a, a particular lineage. So yeah, I, I'd love to move on to kinds. I think after we've had the bathroom break, it's a nice place to, to move the topic onto that. So if we're all happy, we could move on to um, like the definition of kinds and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. 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 I'm good with whatever you want to do. So I think we should, a good place to start there is for a definition. Sure. I know that you gave me one or two definitions last time, but just to, you know, make sure there's no confusion going ahead from now, let's have it again. No problem. Are you asking for a definition from me or Matt? Oh, either of you. I'm assuming it's going to be at least roughly the same. Yeah, yeah I figured since Matt's, this is his time, he can do it. I mean, the, the definition I always give is, is organisms um, that descend from the same ancestral gene pool. Because then it's not solely based on reproduction because we know how genetics work. You know, there's going to be some species that based on genetic differences, based on divergence, they may not be able to do or, or be able to reproduce. There may be physical reasons for that, for example, with a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. But we need to look at the blueprint. We need to look at the um, ge uh, genetics. I don't want to take Matt's time there. I just heard some silence. So I wanted to jump in. But Matt, take over, brother. Take, some, take your time. <clears throat> Yeah, no problem. No, I mean, that's a good answer. Anything that descended from the same ancestral gene pool would, would have the ancestry built in from it. We would be able to look at a human, for example, and say, okay, what makes us different? What makes us stand apart? We say, well, the best way of doing it would be, uh, man, I really like the DNA barcoding. That's a really good way. But a lot of people don't know about it, so there's no reason to bring it up if you've never understood it. So the best way to explain it would be zygote fertilization because we know, for example, that a horse and a donkey and a mule are related, but sometimes they can't interbreed, right? But we know that they can in the zygote fertilization. You can do that in a laboratory, and we can see that they're related. Some people have even tried it with chimps and humans. I mean, go back to the 20s and 30s, and it didn't work. So, and these people were good. Yeah, we, we touched on that last time. Now, the hypothetical I'll give you is that it, basically the same as last time. You agree that over time, populations will, will diverge genetically. Right. If populations are separated. If given enough time, if the genomes are so different that they can't even be fertilized in a lab, will there come a point where those genomes can no longer be compatible? 
Yeah, I can I can jump in. Yeah, of, of of course. See, the thing is, though, if we were to test in vitro, then two species that have diverged from a common ancestor to the point where they're no longer genetically compatible or there's some type of difference there genetically or physically that doesn't allow them to reproduce. I think the, I think the answer is pretty straightforward that um, yeah, in the wild in natural settings, they're not going to bring forth, but in, in vitro type situations, artificial insemination, I mean, there's probably a good chance that they're going to um, be able to bring forth. Because I mean, that's what evolution said. These populations diverge; they become genetically uh, altered to the point where, boom, there, there's a new, there's a new species. Like I, I understand how evolution works. So, so what you're saying is, no matter how much time, if we hypothetically gave a billion years to two separate populations, no matter how much their genomes diverge, they'll still be able to be reproduced, uh, to be fertilized in vitro. Is that well, what you're I, saying? I would say that that would probably be a reasonable, um, a reasonable prediction. Like, I mean, you know, I know that they've tried to do in vitro with uh, chimpanzees and, and humans as uh, disturbing as that is. And, and they've had no, no luck in, in doing so. But I mean, theoretically, uh, see, here's the thing. So you, your question is just so. Our model is the created heterozygosity hypothesis. Okay, so when we look back in time, we're looking at an expansion of the genome. As compared to the evolutionists, they're looking back billions and billions. That's what it comes down to. Theoretically, uh, you know, populations may diverge to the point where it's going to be difficult for them to uh, reproduce. That's why our definition is based on organisms that descend from the original ancestral gene pool, not strictly. Um, not strictly reproduction, but if, if those ancestors, Adam, and I'll explain this real quick, you can take as much time as you want. If they were front loaded with millions of heterozygous DNA sites, okay, and, and stick with me, just picture this. This is compared to the evolutionist that says those DNA sites resulted from mutations over time. And I, I think we're on the same page there, okay? So ours is a different explanation, but this means that the mechanisms by which new species originate um, can occur simply by genetic recombination and gene conversion. And of course, you, you, you have to isolate the pop population, genetic uh, <clears throat> drift is involved, migration, all these things. I'm just saying mechanisms wise that can produce uh, variety because those genetic mechanisms, if the difference is already built in, Adam, they can literally lead to new nuclear chromosome combinations rapidly even as rapidly as, as each uh, generation. But here's the answer to your question. Since the created heterozygous events will decrease in time. For example, if you look at the horse species today, they have, um, they have an abundance of homozygous DNA sites. You know, we are, um, speciation events are reaching walls. There's less speciation events now because because there's less genetic potential. Because we look into the past at expansion of the genome that has now decreased. Now we've got we've gone from more heterozygous gene sites to more homozygous gene sites. So if we go a billion years into the future, well, that combined with genetic entropy, there won't be any. Um, we'll see extinction. You know, it's it's the exact opposite expectations of. Um, of evolution there is no theoretical billions of years from now in our model for your model yeah maybe but not our model so i think you've 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 moved a little bit away from the main point which was things remaining within the same gene pool there how do you explain ring species right so i, I i'm saying i'm not against Ring species. I'm not against you know rabbits or, or species of squirrel that have uh, diverged enough genetically, uh, you know, more morphologically. I mean, I, that's why I've, I brought up the finches. That was a testable prediction that Nathaniel Jensen made. That was observed. I think it was 2017. New species was formed based on shifts from heterozygosity, which is what our model says, to homozygosity, subsequent inbreeding. Um, and, and isolation led to new species. But if um, with the rabbits or like the ring species with the, ra with the rabbits and the squirrels, for example, yeah, maybe in a natural setting, they can't reproduce, but we can do tests genetically, whether it's in vitro or if it's DNA barcoding, or we can look at uh, certain taxonomically restricted genes or even function. We can determine um, if they have descended, which is our definition, from the original ancestral gene pool. Reproduction is a factor, yes. 
but it's not the only factor because I do agree. Some species can diverge and maybe they're not reproducing naturally in the wild. I, I agree with you on that. My big problem with your definition for kinds is, oh, I've got my Alexa telling me a message. Um, where was I? Your, your definition depends on whether things can essentially um, reproduce, uh, produce fertile offspring, whether it's naturally or within a laboratory. We know that genomes, and I know Raw Max admitted, that genomes diverge over time if they're separated. We also know that things stop being able to reproduce if their genomes are too different from each other. How then do we define kinds if we know that sometimes these things are no longer able to reproduce, that they're so genetically different that we couldn't reproduce them even in laboratory settings? Because then you cannot define kinds reliably. So as I said before, my yeah, my definition, or at least a kind, is groups of living organisms that we can look at. We can determine if they be belong in the same created kind if they have descended from the same ancestral gene pool. It seems like you keep going back to just reproduction, but I'm, I'm telling you that there's more uh, ways to determine ancestry. I mean, for example, in, in Darwin's day. Um, his contemporary was Mendel and Mendel did his pea plant experiments and, and he looked at inheritance, you know, Mendelian genetics, for example, recessive and, and dominant, um, you know, genes and alleles and things. But the thing is, they didn't even know anything about genetics. So he was just looking at anatomy. He was looking at maybe the fossil record to determine, you know, what's related, what's not. Nowadays, we have genetics and genetics is where we can determine it's the only direct method of determining ancestry you know a, a fossil is not passed on sperm and egg for example genes traits and genetics so yeah reproduction uh, can be a way to determine what a kind is but um if, if there's been some some divergence in in genetics that has unfortunately if we can't in vitro everything and just in the natural there's some ring species some species that can't reproduce well now we have to go to the next step which is, and I don't want to list them all over again, but it would be in the um, in the genetic realm. But you, you need to know that speciation is occurring due to shifts from heterozygosity, so more genetic diversity, to lower genetic diversity, which means eventually you're going to reach walls. You're going to reach barriers. You're going to reach limits. Evolution can't have limits. You're going to go from a single-celled ancestor billions of years ago to all the life we see today, you know. So, so what about polyploid speciation then? Where the genome is duplicated, or at least regions can be duplicated. Right, so yeah, that, that, that's another good question. You have all good questions. So I would say gene duplications for one are rare events. Um, secondly, polyploidy, it's like, um, you know, for the audience sake, uh, to keep it simple, if a lot of this is, is going over people's heads, have a book. And if you were to uh, duplicate that copy of the book you already own, well, now you don't really have anything meaningful. Now evolution would say, okay, now you're going to get mutations and alterations, friendships, for example, in that duplicated gene or some ge whole genomes duplicate but the thing is that's like adding typographical errors into that second copy of the book you already own it's still going to be deleterious for one duplications are rare uh gene duplications are, are generally um lead to disease and, and and they're detrimental so i don't think that that's any help but it is it is a mechanism i agree but like all beneficial mutations, if you can show me a duplication that is beneficial, it is going to be, um, you know, it's, it's going to be reductive in, in nature. So that's my answer to that. I believe uh, a lot of the plants or the plants that we eat are a result of polyploid mutations. For example. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, the, the thing is, a lot of the plants, too, and, and Mac can speak to this uh, well, especially because this is kind of his forte in his field, but a lot of these heirloom plants and then a lot of the, um, the variations that have been created, artificially created from them, the heirloom plants are a lot, um, obviously, they got way more genetic potential. That's how come you're getting all these different plants from that heirloom plant, but they're also a lot more healthier um, in, in the wild. Matt, did you want to speak to that one? Sure, if you just think about it like an animal, right? If you take a dog and you take it from a wolf and the wolf had more variety and now all of a sudden you create a little chihuahua, if it has a bunch of recessive genes, it can only ever from then on produce more recessive offspring genes. The same thing tends to happen with plants. 
The only thing is, is now we're genetically modifying. So now we're twisting things around. But na in nature, you're just going to get hybridization. And hybridization is a very similar process because things will cross and then their genetic potential gets a little bit dwindled with each time. So that's why heirloom is usually the best. And it's usually the best for people as well. They tend to be a lot healthier as well because when you start genetically modifying things, you're, people are doing it for flavor. So you get like the cherry tomatoes, which are a lot sweeter. You know, you get a corn that can grow in cold places like tomatoes. You know, you're tampering with things, but you're limiting its potential so it can grow in either a particular condition or taste better. So what I, what I get from this is that you're saying, yeah, there are these mutations, but they're all right, always negative. Is that what I'm getting from this? Oh, uh, they can be neutral, but mo most of the time they're limiting in factor, right? We, Do we you accept that there are positive ones though? Right. For example, when we look at the genetic database and we see 6,000 new mutations every three months being added, we know that there's a problem because supposedly there's supposed to be beneficial mutations outweighing these negative ones. And we see every cancer that you can name can be tied to a form of mutation. Where are these mutations that are preventing these things from happening? They're not coming up. They're not anywhere to be seen. We're only getting more damaging mutations being introduced. None of these beneficial ones. All these beneficial ones are being overridden by epigenetic regulation. Every time they think they find a new one, oh, it's lactose. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, guess. It's just, just epigenetic. And that can't change a gene whatsoever, only the way the gene is expressed. So all these beneficial mutations that evolution needs are just wiped out. They're just gone. Then that's where natural selection comes in. So yeah, there are more deleterious and neutral mutations than there are positive ones. But that's what natural selection acts upon. And if there are even just a few positive ones, they will be maintained within the gene pool. Oh yeah, no doubt. That's uh, And that's where the theory of evolution comes. You only need one and one will override the other 20. The only problem with that is experiments aren't showing that. For example, when they went into uh, the Grand Prismatic Springs in Yosemite, they scooped down and pulled up four different organisms. And they took these bacteria back and they, these are the most primitive ones on earth, right? And they tested them. They threw them in multiple different scenarios. And, or I, sorry, they through, they threw these in a lower acidic environment and they tested for beneficial mutations. Nothing happened. The only change was epigenetic. They did the same thing with euka eukaryotic organisms because eukaryotes are what we are, right? So they took yeast and they put them in five different environments. At the end of 1,200 generations, the only thing that happened is they lost genetic information. There were all the beneficial mutations were just non existent and everything was epigenetic. I, I like the study so much, I just threw it right into our book and made a video on it. Is incredible because they need evolution to be true for beneficial mutations and they can't even find them in the most primitive organisms in these experiments the only thing that ever goes up is fitness and that's because of epigenetics i can think of a few beneficial mutations off the top of my head i, I did mention the muscles in um dog eyes that, that causes puppy dog eyes that came about uh, shortly after we domesticated the dog is that not positive Muscles in the eyes. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I have never heard of that. They are muscles with... that give the dogs the ability to do the puppy dog eyes, which we respond to as humans. And they're not present in wolves or some of the more primitive domestic dogs like huskies, for example. Hmm. Well, muscles can uh, originate. Or, you know, there, there's, for example, there's, there's muscles that have been disappearing in the human being. There's one in the wrist. There's one in the neck. Um, there's one that's particular in the knee. I forget the name and it's humans are starting to lose this one. So I would imagine one day if we start regaining it, we, we, or if they found it in people, they'd be like, look, we're gaining a new muscle. Perhaps something like that is happening with the dog. I don't know. It just, well, Matt, couldn't that be, maybe you can expand on it. Couldn't that even be, um, compared to maybe the Italian wall lizards and, and their, um, you know, the muscle that was, um, I guess an example of phenotypic plasticity or, or something to do with um, epigenetics. Could yeah. that be compared to that? Well, Wasn't it's... that involved a, a, mus a, a, a muscular en enhancement in the wall that allowed them to digest uh, things that they previously weren't digesting before? Right, exactly. They, um, they were vegetarian. They started eating plants, and they needed to slow the process of plant material through their colon down. 
right? Because they need bacteria to digest plant rather than acid. So this this new muscle appeared and they said, wow, look at this. It's never seen this before. But when they went back to the mainland, they actually found that all the lizards that ate plants there also had it. So it arises, it comes and goes when it's needed. So maybe these dogs just needed it and they just started uh, manipulating people with it. <laughs> and, so, you're saying, so you're saying the wall, oh, what was that? Something crashed. Uh oh. Oh, no, no problem. It was my kid's toy. <laughs> keep oh, going, right. keep going. So are you saying that the, the dog kind that was around on the Ark had these puppy dog eye muscles? Uh, I think only wolves and a fox were probably on the Ark. But what do you think, Standing? Because wolves don't well, have... I, I, yeah, I, I would say if, if those... Um, if that information was was there for the so-called puppy dog eyes, I mean, I'll have to look in, into that exact example, but I'm, that, that's why I'm looking at other examples that, um, you know, we do know more of, like the Italian wall lizards. We can see a lot of examples of phenotypic plasticity or just environmental related changes where that was already in in the potential of the genome, um, you know, to to take place. I mean, are these puppy dog eyes, are they beneficial to them, the yeah. muscles? For manipulating people, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. Well, it's it's kind of like um, you know a lot of people say, well, what about blue eyes? You know that, that, that there's a so-called neutral mutation. You know, blue eyes look good, but the but the data on blue eyes, for example, suggests and a lot of people don't know this that people with blue eyes have more uh, susceptibility to uh, light sensitivity and, and other eye related diseases. So usually there is some type of detrimental effect to these changes. And I, I would predict that if I look into these puppy dog eyes or, or the muscles uh, that you're talking about, that was beneficial. I, I can almost guarantee that there's probably something uh, negative associated with it. But even if, and, and I always say this to, to, uh, to the evolutionists too, because um, you know, there are examples that you can give, you know, oftentimes I'm given like the example of the notothinioid fish that supposedly evolved proteins um, in, in the Arctic to keep them from freezing, you know, examples like this. But the thing is, even if, you know, we gave you, Adam, or the evolutionists, you know, one or two beneficial mutations that are truly not um, deleterious, picture it this way. If, if you're... If, if the whole genome is degenerating based on all these, you know, nearly neutral mutations, the, the detrimental ones, for example, that natural selection, yeah, I can get rid of some of the, the detrimental ones. But while the genome is degenerating in all these other ways, and while a few nucleotide sites may be improving based on a couple beneficials here and there, huge numbers are still being degraded. So it comes down to a trade-off. You know, I've, doc I've debated Dr. Stefan Frello and he, that's what he said. He said, well, it's, it's a trade-off, you know, it's beneficial in some areas, detrimental in, in another yeah. area. But the question is, Adam, is that trade-off sustainable? Because we can see in experiments, real-time experiments that, let, let's say Lenski's bacterial experiments, for example, well, that type of trade-off results in shrinking functional genome sizes so you're throwing out all this information from lots of nucleotide sites and then you're trying to replace all that information with one single desirable i don't know let's say a point mutation or a, a gene duplication um the fact that most beneficials are reductive anyways the trade-off just won't be sustainable and we see that in, in lenski's experiment so i mean i understand that that's the philosophy of the evolutionist i just don't think that it's uh, demonstrable or uh, empirical a lot of what you've said over this over this last part of the conversation has come down to your ideas of genetic entropy, essentially, which I say again is almost like a, a plaything of creationist organisations. It's not something that's taken seriously in modern science. So for, for you to constantly go back to this assumption that genetic entropy is just happening and therefore it explains all these things, well, no, you haven't explained that explanation, so you can't use that. Um, well, I mean, we've got, I mean, a multitude of papers. You can look at the genetic uh, database. Um, I think Matt um, iterated that er earlier, maybe in the other dialogue. I mean, you can see how many diseases, thousands of diseases are added every single year. You can see that there's um, papers so, after so, papers so, of, of genetic diseases, cancers are on or are skyrocketing. Um, even, even the fact that these beneficial mutations, anyways, most of them are now known to be reductive. I mean, there's paper upon paper. Yeah, I, I can send you papers right now that 
prove that a lot of these so-called pre-humans, Adam, um, that the evolutionists will point to as, uh, you know, our, our uh, ancestors or even our cousins, like, like the Neanderthals, for example, the uh, Homo floresiensis, which is the hobbits, or Nelidae, Erectus, of Heidelbergensis. I've got paper after paper showing that that these so-called uh, primitive humans were not primitive humans. They were highly degenerate modern humans because it's shown that they're highly inbred due to genetic um, mutation accumulation. And this inbreeding, this uh, reductive evolution resulted in their reduced brain size, reduced body size in some cases with the hobbits, the pathologies that are seen. Uh, mammoth populations, I got a, a, pop, uh, a paper here that shows that they were highly inbred and they carried an, an elevated genetic load leading to their extinction. Lenski's experiment, which we can look at today. Uh, viruses, the H1N1 virus, for example, there's a paper and it's not published in a creationist journal. It's published in a, a secular journal from Dr. John Sanford and Robert Carter. He showed that the H1N1 virus went from a red hot pandemic to a whimper to an extinction event in 90, 90 years based on a linear accumulation of mutations genetic entropy at work he demonstrated so i mean i could probably give you 10 10 papers right now showing um the validity of genetic entropy take your time i talked a lot there again you go into specific species we need to see a universal trend. It's a, you can find any phenomenon in any number of species. So whenever you talk about genetic entropy, you always talk about humans, which for a long time now have essentially bypassed natural selection, which is a thing that gets rid of deleterious mutations and adds positive ones. Well, not adds, but it, it accumulates them. A lot of these genetic entropy experiments or things that I've seen are on domesticated animals, which go through the same process. So you can take specific examples and say this phenomena applies to that, but that doesn't show a universal trend. You need to show that this is universal for it to be seen as a universal trend. You can't just say we found it in these two, therefore it applies to everything, because that's what you're doing. Well, mitochondrial clocks are one way that we can we can do these things, right? So we want to know the mitochondrial rate in different things. Have you ever noticed that when it's pinned up against <clears throat> phylogenetic methods, that they they differ by orders of magnitude? A huge difference like everything shows that they sh everything should be hundreds of thousands of years old yet the observed trio studies all get thousands of years so they're complete contradictory with each other the observed and unobserved and you're saying that mutation rates are inconsistent un uh, well i'm just saying that uh the mutation rates themselves all show in everything it doesn't matter what it's tested that it's faster than the assumed phylogenetic method so that is a mutation rate that they're looking at that's how they build those uh, those charts when you're looking at when you're looking at a, what a mutation is that's one of the ways we can show genetic entropy in name rabbits uh, uh alligators shark uh snakes your favorite we would look at the mutation rate and then boom we have a genetic entropy from that model as well because it's all faster than the assumed evolutionary model I don't, think that, I don't think what you said implies that everything has genetic entropy. Well, if you wanted to test how old a species is, let's say that they want to know how old a new snake is, for example, they, they might go, well, what's the mutation rate of this new snake? Maybe we can test it. And they, they look inside of it and they go, well, it's building up 100 new near, new, near neutral mutations every generation, right? So that way they can that way they don't have to look at detrimental or positive they just they just test the junk basically the neutral ones and they go okay well it seems to have a compilation of eighteen thousand total in it so they knew when that species arise so that way we can look and go make a mutational rate clock out of that because if every new generation they acquire 100 new neutral mutations we go okay well now we know what mutation load is so now out of those 100 how many are detrimental and how many are positive well they do they show that as well so when I did my genetic analysis of cobras, I put it into something called MEGA, which looks at mutation rates, differences in um, certain parts of the genome. And it measures all these cobras against each other. There was also an outgroup of vipers. And it measured at millions of years difference. So are there several kinds of cobra? Uh, what was the method you used? It's just straight DNA. Um, you look at the differences in the genomes or the genes that we experiment, we analyzed, and you look at the differences between them, and you take mutation rates of the snakes and you apply that into it. 
you, you put it into the uh, the test. And it comes out with a phylogenetic tree, which shows you roughly how long ago they were related and and in order of relation. Oh, okay. Well, you said which, how, they, how, they, how they grouped. I see. So you said it right there. It was a phylogenetic tree. The phylogenetic trees take evolutionary assumptions and add it in. So they assume what happens is the snakes from a lizard, and they believe that this happened around 200 million years ago. So what they'll do is they'll add the mutation rate and extrapolate it like they did. No, you don't, you don't put any supposed dates in there. All you put in is mutation rates and the genetic data. Well, it seems to be different with humans. Uh, for example, when they take... Well, that's the thing. It's got to be universal. It's got to be everything. That's what I'm saying. You can't just say this specific group have a, a common ancestor of so long ago you're saying that everything went through a bottleneck at exactly the same time four and a half thousand years ago therefore everything has to have that bottleneck everything has to have arisen at that time so proving that anything doesn't mark, line up with that eliminates it as an option well, that's actually what the CO1 gene barcoding actually did show. It actually did show the little genetic diversity. So it's a little bit different. You're, the mutation rate that you were doing to build your phylogenetic tree, for example, when they were building it with mitochondrial Eve, they said, well, if we just look at trio studies and we know that she's inheriting, let's just say, 100 new mutations every generation, and we take that back, it arises just a few thousand years ago. But what we're going to do is because we know evolution is true, we're going to add the 6.5 million years when we believe they were related to chimps and we're going to add it in and that's called the phylogenetic method well the same thing is probably happening with these animals as well they see the rate and it doesn't match what it's supposed to so they're they extrapolate the phylogenetic assumption and into the models and there you go you get your millions of years so and how do you so how do you explain my my analysis then where i didn't put any dates in there were no supposed dates put into it i find took that DNA samples from a whole host of cobras from africa and asia and we compared the genomes and from those comparisons the number of differences between them the estimated divergence time was in the millions of years that's strange because we know that reptiles actually have some of the fastest mitochondrial clocks on earth even faster than humans so if humans are showing to be about six thousand to seven thousand years old and reptiles are not that makes me suspicious about what's going on because reptiles do have the fastest mitochondrial clock inside of them at all. I'll show you the the, the so, study. So how would you respond to that then? If Adam, the analysis I'll, I'll, millions of years. I'll, I'll respond to it. So with those snakes, are you doing the phylogenetic analysis based on the gene sequencing of mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA? There were two genes from mitochondrial DNA. One of them I know was cytochrome B. That was a okay. that was definitely a mitochondrial. Uh, bit of dna i think there was another one there was nt3 i could go i could go and find them but i can't think of the rest on my top of my head i know that nt3 cytochrome b can't remember the other ones off the top of my head so you're using like uh conserved mitochondrial genes we were using a variety of genes but the best thing about that is that you can get instead of just doing one gene where there could be a, a problem or that particular gene uh, goes at a different rate. If you take a whole host of different genes and analyze them, it gives you better accuracy. So we took, I believe from my experiment, it was five different genes. And th they pretty much all came up with the same answer. Right. So, but it's all mitochondrial genes you're looking at? No, there were some mitochondrial and some nuclear. More mitochondrial uh, uh, genes than nuclear? Yeah. Or, no, like, there were more nuclear, nuclear ones. There were more nuclear? And then how do you explain the origin of nuclear DNA differences? The origin of nuclear DNA differences would be mutation. And then how do we explain the origin of nuclear DNA differences? How do you explain it? Yes. I imagine mutation. Well, no, it, and, and that's the thing. Like we don't want to talk past each other. That's why um, I always try and clarify with our uh, created heterozygosity hypothesis. The, um, the nuclear DNA 
we're saying was front loaded. The vast majority of nuclear DNA is the result of divine creation. Okay. So that's why processes like recombination gene conversion, okay, on these front loaded nuclear DNA differences can uh, result in new chromosomal combinations uh, quick. So you're assuming in your phylogenetic analyses there that um, all those nuclear DNA differences that, that you're looking, uh, looking at are the result of mutation over time. Do you know the mutation rate and speciation rate of, of the particular snakes you're looking at? Certainly not off the top of my head, no. I did this study a few years back. Well, and, and that's kind of what Nathaniel Jensen's doing is he's making specific predictions on mutation rates and speciation rates in, in animals that have not yet been measured. I'm taking the challenge to them now and saying, hey, Let's go out and there's a, there's a fox in the woods. I bet you I can tell you how fast his mutation rate is. So, um, I mean, we'd have to look at, like, how many, how many snake species, for example, on this, on this planet right now? On this planet? A few thousand? So, I mean, a, a few thousand snake species from a handful of snake kinds off of the ark is easy to explain. But, like, how come there's not? So, for example, let's say birds and snakes or even lizards. So, birds have, like, 11,000 species, 12,000. Snakes, let's say, 3,000. That's consistent with our model, you know, of these species coming from a handful of kinds off of the ark. But according to, let's say, birds, for example. You say birds evolved from dinosaurs, you know, theropod dinosaurs millions and millions of years ago. Why are there not hundreds of thousands of bird species? Or why are there not thousands and thousands of snake species? Because either there's no need for speciation in large populations or there's a large uh, extinction rate or a combination of the two. But then you said in, our, in the last discussion and debate, you can't make predictions on speciation rates because there's so many variables and, and factors involved in it. Yeah, I know. So a lot of what you're saying then will just have to unfortunately be the result of inference, uh, storytelling, because if there's no testable predictions that can flow from th that explanation, well, then it's it's not it's not science. Like I know with, with mitochondrial DNA, a lot of evolutionists will say, well, you know, natural selection filtered out all the um, mitochondrial DNA differences that arose in the millions of years to overcome the 6,000 year explanation and empirical evidence for mitochondrial, uh, even mitochondrial DNA. But the thing is, you'll ask them, okay, well, what testable prediction can you make? You know, what's what's the mutation again for the Khoisan peoples, for example? Because Dr. Jensen made a prediction on the Khoisan peoples and, and they'll say, well, you know, there's too many variables, too many factors. But where they're saying there's too many variables and factors, we have uh, scientists like Dr. Nathaniel Jensen actually considering those and making direct, very precise predictions. I mean, we'll see if they come true, you know, on the Khoisan peoples in the future, but um, that means it's science. Science has to deal with, you know, that which is testable and that which is falsifiable. I just think, you know, a, a few thousand snake species, that's easy to explain according to our model, but millions. And I mean, um, the oldest snake species in the fossil record, how, how long ago um, was that? Like it's fossil wise, like 150 million years or something. 167 million years. Wouldn't you expect more species then than just a few thousand? Not necessarily, no. Because of the variables and factors you, you were saying? Because a, 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 big, a big point with, with all this too is, you know, 11,000 bird species, a few thousand snake species, four or 5,000 lizard species coming from or 30 cat species, for example, um, you know, coming from a handful of art kinds just 4,500 years ago is easy to explain, especially based on our model of, you know, pre-existing genetic diversity. But yet the evolutionist wants us to believe that all these different species came about from a single celled organism long ago and far away, billions and billions of years ago. I mean, that is where the, um, imagination lies it seems it seems like our model is stronger when it comes to the species i disagree entirely i, I, did want to ask I, don't, want to, I don't want to go too far from the point because i don't think i've had a satisfactory answer how would you respond satisfactorily to study saying that these animals are uh they diverge over millions of years like the cobras for example are you saying there's more than one cobra kind you said um, I, I did explain uh, that. Yeah, you said the, uh, what was it, uh, hetero, can you give me the phrase again? Well, I'm just, I'm just saying that if you're doing a phylogenetic analysis based on 
the assumption that those nuclear DNA differences that you're looking at are the result of only mutation over time. Well, yeah, you're going to get um, similar analyses. That's why Dr. Jensen's making specific predictions under the assumption of his model, of our model, the created heterozygosity hypothesis. Now, the, now the mitochondrial DNA, yeah, that's based on, uh, you know, constant mutation rates over time. So if, if the snake uh, phylogenetic analyses you're looking at is showing that the, uh, you said it was the cytochrome B in, in the yeah. mitochondria that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. And that revealed um, mutation rates in, in DNA differences in the mitochondria consistent with millions of years, or was it the nuclear DNA that revealed that? It was all of it. All of it in combination. Essentially, yeah. They yeah. All match them. You test them separately, and then you you put them, to, you basically compare them. Yeah, exactly. So with the um, with the mitochondrial DNA, if you're just looking at that and not considering the nuclear DNA and your phylogenetic analyses, what is the origin of the mitochondrial DNA? Is it thousands of years? Is it a hundred thousands of years? It's millions of years. If you just looked at the mitochondrial DNA, yeah, I, I'd have to I'd have to look at what the um, actual because I know that the, the nuclear DNA, for example, let's say for humans, seems to go back coalescence wise, you know, millions and millions of years. But that just that, that that's based on the assumption that all those nuclear DNA differences are the result of uh, mutation and not you know created uh, DNA diversity. The mitochondrial DNA in humans though does go back six thousand years because we explain the origin of mitochondrial DNA differences for the most part as mutations over time. So if the snakes that you're looking at in this phylogenetic analyses in the mitochondrial DNA alone is going back millions of years, I would just have to uh, see or even ask you if you know offhand, what, what is the mutation rate in, in those snakes you're looking at? I, I can't make a valid judgment if I don't know the, we know the, the mitochondrial mutation rate in humans, um, which is why we can make direct predictions on, on human groups that haven't been measured. But um, yeah, what is the, what's the mitochondrial uh, mutation rate in, in the, um, in, in the cytochrome B gene that you're looking at in the snakes. Again, I can't recall off the top of my head. I did it a while ago. I haven't looked at the paper for some, for, a, for a while. Uh, because snakes is your expertise, I'm actually just curious because uh, um, I uh, appreciate your knowledge on it. Uh, from my understanding, there's there's two mutually incompat incompatible theories of snake evolution, from my understanding. Um, some say that, that they evolved from water reptiles, right, mosasaurs, yeah. or others say from bur um burrowing lizards like what which one do you hold to there's a reason it's very controversial you can take your time and, and, and you can have the floor and explain i personally was suspect they were burrowing animals much the same way that lizards these days are losing limbs and becoming very snake-like and they're burrowing animals what would the people or the uh, evolutionists that hold to the theory of, because you said that you believe that they evolved from the burrowing, uh, burrowing lizards? I'd, uh, I'd, I, again, it's a controversy because nobody really knows. But from what I know, I would go 60-40 in favor of burrowing. You would, okay. And then the ones that hold to the theory that maybe they evolved from water reptiles, right? The mosasaurs, mm -hmm. um, like what, what would be their disagreements in regards to the uh, burrowing lizards? I think it's very much lifestyle. And you do also find a lot of fossil snakes that were aquatic. Najash, for example, I believe was, um, Oh no, not Jash, Najash. Uh, I can't remember. There's all the Italian, the Latin names. And all rather complicated, but there are a few fossil snakes from very early on that were aquatic. Um, what? Okay, so let's. Okay, so you hold to the theory that they evolved from burrowing lizards? Then I don't hold to it. Okay, I, I get what you're saying. So, like, you would see the evidence sixty forty leans more towards that one. Personal opinion, yes. There'll be a lot of people that disagree with me, but that's what I think. Okay. So we know, and, and I don't have to go over all the differences, but we know snakes are very different from lizards. What kind of mutations would you say were responsible for transforming those burrowing lizards into snakes? Well, the things that really define snakes is not leglessness, because obviously there's a lot of lizards that are leglessness that you don't call snakes. Most of the differences you'll probably find are in the skull. They've got quite a derived skull compared to a lizard. 
Right. But in, in the jaw hinge, like I know snakes have fangs and a flexible jaw hinge, whereas lizards have, I think, flat teeth and immobile skulls, right? Yeah, the snake skull, it's separate on the lower jaw and it spreads out. A lot of people think they dislocate, which is complete rubbish. What about um, like the fact, like with movement, for example, I know lizards move by, I think they, they, they twist their stiff body or even use their legs, but the tails of snakes are totally different. They're, they're short and they don't break off when grabbed. You said you own a few snakes, you would know that. In, mm -hmm. in comparison to lizards, they've got the longer tails that can break off if another animal grabs it. Only like, some lizards. Pardon? Only some lizards. Only, only, so some lizards would, are you saying, would they uh, be more yeah, geckos, comparable in tails to the snakes? Geckos, for example, are a group that can drop their tail. But they're still far different than like snakes. They use their, um, th their tails are short. They're, they're um, mechanically far different than your, you said geckos? You get short tailed lizards as well. Just look at the Euromastics, for example. Right, right. So are, are you, so you're more so looking to like the skull morphology and things like yeah. that versus what, say. What, what defines snakes from lizards is mostly in the skull. Is mostly in, in, in the skull. Yeah. Um, Cause I know like snakes, don't they move if we're, since we're on movement, don't they move by gliding and, and, and they use the bottom scales on their body? There's a lot of different ways that they move around. Some of them have the S pattern that you see in popular TV and that, they move from side, their body from side to side in order to have forward motion. Some of them move almost like in a straight line by movements of the the, um, the ventral scales and the muscles below them. And then you've got things like the sidewinder, which just fling themselves. There's all sorts of different motions for how snakes move. Don't, um, like one that I'm curious about, like for example, um, not only do snakes have fangs and a flexible jaw hinge, where the lizards, as we were um, discussing, have flat teeth and immobile skulls, but you're saying it's in the skulls that, that we would look at for the defining features. Um, mm -hmm. we, we know some snakes have heat pits on their mm -hmm. nose, but then they also have no external ears. Um, lizards, on the other hand, lack heat pits, but they do have external ears. Like, how would you explain that difference? Is, is that something that just evolved over time that we can see in the fossil record, or is that something that's inferred to have evolved? Well, well you mentioned that only some snakes have the heat pits. So you've got snakes that don't have heat pits. For example, all the snakes I own, not none of them has any heat pits. So I don't see where you're trying to go with heat pits. Well, I'm, I'm just, I guess, going over a lot of the, um, cause even if like some snakes may have this and some don't or with lizards, you know, with the tails, you know, some may have a, sh a shorter one, but there still are these defining features that would need to be explained evolutionary wise, how that burrowing lizard evolved into um, a snake as, as we would know today. And it, it seems like a lot of the evidence, especially from the fossil record involves uh, things that are lost, right? Legs, for example. So my question would be how, how does loss of genetic and anatomical structures to you um, provide substantial or sufficient evidence for um, that type of uh, evolution that would say burrowing lizards evolved into snakes over time. Bob, well, could you repeat that in um, in fewer words, please? I'm trying to get the point of your question. Um, how does loss of genetic and anatomical structures provide evidence for lizard to snake evolution? How does loss of genetic information provide evidence for lizard to snake evolution? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Well, that's not really the thing we looked at when we said that snakes were derived from lizards. Right. We don't look at genes and say they've lost genetic information, therefore they evolved from lizards. It's, it's different things. I know, but, but what I'm saying is in the fossil record, for example, what we look at um, is snakes you're saying that they evolved from lizards but then yeah. the fossil snake species we see um that actually have like those um i guess hind hind legs mm -hmm. you could say um it looks like the further back the, the furthest back you can go the snakes you find they don't have any legs and then you can find some snakes with legs 50 yeah. to 100 million years later yeah um and then but it, but it should be like the reverse like why I guess based on your reasoning, 
And because I, I imagine that the differences we're talking about and how those changes would be required, we can infer from the fossil record. But um, snakes, so you're saying snakes would have gained legs and then like, I see reversals in the fossil record. Like how no. do you explain that? This is a fundamental, fundamental misunderstanding of how evolution works. You get a population of snakes. Now the original snakes would have had legs because as I mentioned, leglessness isn't the defining characteristic of snakes it's in the skull so the original snakes would probably have had legs you would then have the divergence of these big groups of snakes you find it when when there are adaptations there's usually radiation we get masses of groups of these animals and they spread across large areas of land maybe even across the globe so back millions of years ago say 200 millions of years ago you probably would have had snakes in various parts of the world with legs over the next millions of years, some of those groups of snakes would have lost their legs. Some of those snakes might have been fossilized, and that's like the, the ones you see in the fossil record. So you've got legless snakes showing up in the fossil record. You've still got snakes with legs living elsewhere in the world that either went extinct later on or lost their legs later on. And you still get some of those legged snakes moving on through the years and to the point where say 20 million years ago, you still had snakes with legs. It's not, it, the snakes didn't all evolve as one single population. The snakes would have radiated as lizards, with, uh, as snakes with legs into multiple populations. Some of them would have become legless long before the others, or some of them may never have stopped being legless and just gone extinct and lift only the legless snakes. So to have the earliest fossil snakes we find to be legless, and some legged snakes to be found later on in the fossil record isn't a problem at all. Right. So it's just because my point is like, according to our model, of course, um, in, in, as I've said many times, it's genes that are inherited. I think genes is, is where we can uh, directly determine, you know, what's related, what's not the origin of these treat, uh, traits in regards to, let's say the lizards to snake evolution. We do see snakes with no legs. We mm -hmm. see uh, snakes with with the um, you know the hind legs, for example. Uh, but according to our model, the, the, those layers, uh, yeah, those layers are not uh, you know they are uh, not absolute ages of, of time. So uh, it, it looks like the evidence would suggest, yeah, either the snakes with the with the hind limbs are used as we can see today for copulation, reproductive purposes. I think for cl clasping. Um, during reproduction, like, would you agree with, with that function or would you say that they're completely worthless, the hind legs? Trying to think, because there's, there's quite a lot of groups of snakes that still have it, and I believe yeah. it, it varies between species. Because I'm trying to, like, the ones you see with hind legs in the fossil record, they could either be, like, today used for reproductive purposes as a function or... Or like for example, Najash, Najash is, is that is that the the name? Uh, of the... Two legged snake. Yeah, it's got two hind limbs. Is it, isn't that a, and that's a genus of snake, right? Najash, yes. like there's many species yeah. in that genus. Yeah. Um, so that snake has the hind limbs on the side of its body, though, right? Versus it's coming from the side of the body, isn't that? I remember you pointed that out before. Yeah, that's you don't you you won't find lizards with legs below. They're always right. Um, right side right and, and that's like a defining trait in in that um in in, in the fossils of the, of the genus najash that uh, you would point to that say okay here's your two-legged snake um that would be your your transition between your uh, burrowing lizard to your snakes with legs not necessarily that, because as i said leglessness is not the the def definitive characteristic of snakes it's in the skull Right. Are, are you familiar with the, I think it's the HA1 gene um, for back legs. It's, it's in a, a non-functional or degraded form in snakes. That's why sometimes you can see snakes that are, that are born with these useless legs that, that don't actually function because that gene is broken, suggesting that there were some species of snake in the beginning. Like according to the Bible, right? The serpent was cursed. 
and that serpent would have had legs. And if God, um, you know, through epigenetic purposes or just, um, you know, the damaging of, of genes, like we see with this H A one gene, it was a process over time that these snakes would, would lose legs based on the uh, degradation of, of that gene, for example. I mean, that's consistent with, with our model of uh, snake species with uh, some legs like uh, Najash, for example, that have lost them over time. And snake species like like the furthest uh, snake species we can see in the fossil record that have no legs at all, or just basic hind limbs that sometimes evolutionists will say are, are vestigial, but they're actually used for reproductive purposes. So that would be, I think, pretty consistent with, with our model. T take your time, yeah, go ahead. How, it's interesting what you, you brought up there. So God would say, be gone with your legs snake how did it work there was it instant or was it over time uh good question yeah i'm i'm proposing uh theoretically that it was um it was over time because you can see that 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 specific gene for legs for the back legs is is degraded and it is in a non-functional form so if if god cur because it says god cursed the serpent so if, if if those genes were because you've got garden of eden you've got the serpent but you've got also outside the garden of eden you've got snake species that theoretically like najash would have uh the hind legs mm -hmm. that they would lose them over time yeah that's, so, that's so i don't think he'd be lost them right away no do you think all the fossils of snakes were caused by the Noah's flood? Um, I, I would say that the majority, like for example, the ones that are found 100 million uh, years ago or 150 million years ago, for example, like with Najash. What's Najash? 100 million years ago that they've discovered that one? Because you would say that snakes evolved from lizards 200 millions of years ago, right? Was it during the Jurassic period, maybe? It was around the Jurassic, yeah, I believe. Yo, okay, so we'll uh, the oldest fossil snakes we have uh, are that long, but the genetics, yeah, goes back further, obviously. Yeah, okay. Yeah, then, yeah, they would have um, been fossilized during the flood. That's right. So there are some snakes in the fossil record that have legs. Some have two legs, some have four legs, some have no legs. So after God punished them, some of them lost their legs at quicker rates than others. Yeah, that's right, because I'm saying that God would have cursed. Uh, if they're going to lose their legs and we see that there's this gene, what is it, the HA1 gene, I think it's called. hope I'm not butchering that. Um, I can look it up. But that is in a functionless form in, in snakes. We can see that today, sequencing their uh, genetics. The snakes we see in the fossil record, they're just bones. So, you know, we can infer the best we can, but we don't have any genes. We don't have a, a bone, like I said, it's not passed on sperm and an egg. I think that's an appropriate inference that um, there would have been uh, snakes, with legs at creation, we see that the serpent had legs and, and, you know, he was cursed. If it was a genetic curse where over time, um, and like you said, yeah, maybe some snake species lost it faster than some based on environmental conditions. Um, cause we know that a lot of, um, a lot of change is environmentally dependent. So I think that that's perfectly consistent. Yeah. Were well, certain lizards cursed as well then? A uh, good question. Yeah. So uh, over time, we can see that there's uh, certain lizard species right now. Uh, are they the skinks, for example? I believe that they are burrowing lizards and they are losing their legs. Yeah. Yeah, that well, the thing is the curse at the very beginning of creation in a uh, world with no accumulated mutations versus today in a world with accumulated mutations, legs, as you've said, or uh, fish, uh, you know, blind cave fish, they would be uh, prone to losing um, traits or features uh, such as that. So, yeah, I would just say that that uh, loss of anatomy, loss of genetic information is consistent with our model of uh, genetic entropy and reductive evolution. I will say it's hardly a curse, though, because snakes are one of the most successful species on the planet. They've, their likenesses has allowed them to take advantage of a whole host of environments. They can be arboreal, they can be terrestrial, they could be um, subterrestrial, they could be aquatic. Their leglessness has allowed them to radiate to loads of different areas, and they're very widespread. You, would you still consider it a curse, even though that's the case? So would you like, in, in your next life, would you like to come back as a snake that has to crawl around on its belly, eating dust all day? Well, they don't eat dust. Okay, well, answer the question, though. Would you 
So, okay, well, is, is there a disadvantage at birth when you get that snake that is, is just born and has to crawl around on its belly? I mean, you know, in, in, in the world of, um, you know, predators and things like that, isn't there a disadvantage? Okay. I mean, I agree with you that, that any kind of species is going to be able to uh, learn to adapt to its uh, environment, of course. And you can even see that in like Lenski's bacteria, for example. But when you, you know, those bacteria are, are um, adapting to their artificial environment as well. And yet um, we can see that, that they're doing it through lots of, um, lots of function, lots of, uh, lots of traits, lots of information. So, I mean, yeah, I'm not against adaptation if that's what you're getting at. To answer your question, I would, if I was a snake, I wouldn't mind because that's how snakes live. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, okay. Hey, go ahead. Uh, because you're a herpetologist, I wanted to give um, you some considerable time discussing snake evolution. I mean, you're, okay. you know, that's your field. Uh, but I, I did want to go back to one point before I forget it. I keep trying to keep it on the back of my head, or in the back of my mind, from when you were discussing with Matt, because you were talking about how like a universal genetic entropy. Uh, if we can see it in, in viruses, okay, the H1N1 virus, which has high generation and high mutation rates, what about in the long-term um, E. coli experiment by Lenski, which, I mean, I've, I've mentioned many times, so I'm sure you're familiar with, but um, that work does show that, for one, the rate of beneficial mutations is less than one per million, and then that experiment clearly showed that most of the documented beneficials were loss of function mutations. And I think that that's a perfect reflection of what we are um, describing as reductive evolution or, um, or, or genetic entropy. So if we can see it in humans, which you say there's a problem with because lack of natural selection, okay, fine. We can see it in mammoth populations. We can see it in bacteria. We can see it in viruses. Uh, we can see it in inbred populations, of course, because then that's just going to speed up the degeneration process. We can see it with, with the accumulation of, di of disease. Um, like, is that not uh, universal enough for you? No, because we've got examples where the genome isn't decreasing. Then what? Well, for example, polyploid. Right, but that's increasing um, genetic information. The dogs one, the puppy dog eyes again. That's ca caused by a change in the genes, which results in these these um, these more. These new are, you saying, are, are you saying that wolves don't have these puppy dog eyes or the, or the muscles associated with them in a, in a much more degenerate form? They don't have the muscles. I think they do in a, in a degenerate form that have been amplified in uh, artificially bred dogs that have now uh, served a, a benefit to some kind, I believe. No? No. With, with gene, uh, you'd have to look into that, but that's... Um, I believe that, that the wolves do have it in more of a degenerate form, but we can look into that after. Uh, but the gene duplications that you're referring to, um, like I said earlier, are universally deleterious. There's, there's no, you can have 10 copies of the same book and start introducing typographical errors in, in those extra copies of, of the original book. You're not gonna really get anything new and, and meaningful. I mean, typographical errors indicate mistakes. Um, and that's what we see with Mutations plus duplications are rare. I mean, I pointed out earlier, like, is there other than natural selection and, and based on the known functionality of the genome, the known functionality of all the genomic elements, including the pseudogenes, ERVs, um, you know, the, the various classes of retro trans, transposons. I mean, they're crucial for um, genetic health and, and function. Um, if, 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 and if, if the genome, the genetic information is, is nested, and it's overlapping, any small little change is going to be not neutral. It's going to have some type of deleterious effect, um, even if it's invisible to selection. That's the point. What type of selection can you give me that's going to be able to filter out those nearly neutral mutations that are only just very subtle on, on the genetic content? Natural selection. So it's, it's only, so, but if natural selection, Adam, is only acting upon the most detrimental mutations, and amplifying a few really beneficial mutations, well, how, what's it gonna do against the worst kind of mutations, which are the nearly neutral, uh, very subtle mutations that are just very slightly deleterious? What does it do against, it can't see those. If it's very slightly deleterious, then it is deleterious. 
Right, but it's it's like it's like a book the size of an encyclopedia. You get one single spelling mistake on its own, it's inconsequential. But the buildup of them over time degrades the message, degrades the book, and that's what we see with these nearly nearly neutral mutations. If the genome was truly 90% junk. You've got 10 mutations that are deleterious entering the human population per person per generation. But we now know that that's false. We know that the genome is a lot more functional than that. So therefore you've got many more deleterious mutations accumulating per person per generation. Natural selection is only gonna get rid of the worst. The ones that are very subtle to fitness, like that single spelling mistake in a book the size of an encyclopedia, they will build up. That's why we see the, the genetic disease. That's, I mean, you gotta have a type of mechanism or else it's just, you're just hanging out in the realm of philosophy. Okay. Uh, okay well, let's do this. Cause actually we went for a couple hours. It's been a lot of fun. My kids have been up for a little while. You're the guest here. Um, actually, there's a few other things I wanted to discuss, but for sake of time, maybe we can do a third one. Cause there's so many points to, to touch on, especially with kinds and speciation. Um, let's um, give you a few uh, moments, even a minute or so, to kind of sum up what you think, maybe address some of the points you feel like are hanging. Uh, Adam, take your time. I've enjoyed myself tonight, so thank you, all three of you, for, for being here and having this discussion. It's, uh, it's good to do this sort of thing when, let's be, let's be honest, we can't really do anything else. <laughs> the main thing I'm taking away from tonight is that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Out of boy praise. We haven't, we, haven't, we haven't heard enough of that low, of that whatever it is that praise is playing with. We um, a, a lot of it has come down to genetic entropy, and as I've said a couple of times, that's simply not an idea that's taken seriously in modern science. And because everything seems to fall down to that, and this idea of created heterozygosity which is just asserted without anything backing it up um the fact that i'm told i have a problem with a bottleneck of ten thousand when the opposition has a bottleneck of four it's a lot of the stuff is just just it strikes me as very vague very much an exercise in cherry picking and quite frankly you haven't convinced me um is it okay if I ask you one question before yep. we end it? Um, like w with our model, right? The created heterozygosity uh, hypothesis. If we're saying that the new species are going to arise through shifts from more heterozygous nuclear DNA to more homozygous nuclear DNA, which is what we've seen in, in these new finch species, for example, um, that would that would mean, according to our model, that those new species are effectively losing a number of those heterozygous DNA variants that were front loaded in, in the created kind. So my question um, in regards to that would be that if, if according to our model that, that speciation potential um, lies within the ability to um, spawn genetically and, and visually diverse offspring based on heterozygosity levels, would high heterozygosity wouldn't that indicate higher potential for speciation while lower levels of heterozygosity would represent a lower potential to speciate? Would you agree with that? Speciation is very much dependent on what's happening with the population regarding its environment. It's not necessarily down to the makeup of the genome. It's whether group or populations are isolated from one another and their genomes allowed to diverge. Right. No. And, and I agree with that. But I'm trying to say, because because you like a lot of it, you I just want to make sure that you understand before this conversation ends. Um, you're asking, like, well, you know, where's the limits or what happens in, in billions of years from now? But high heterozygosity levels would represent a greater potential for um, change for allelic variety. What, would you agree with that? Higher heterozygosity would it would mean higher potential for change in speciation. Right. So you've changed things there. You, you change it from allelic variation to speciation. Well, because the higher allelic variation you have, the greater potential for change, the greater potential for speciation. If, if, if the process of speciation involves shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity, the lower heterozygosity you have, like low heterozygosity, as compared to high 
um, heterozygosity would represent a lower potential for speciation and change. And why do we see in species today, like the horse species, for example, they have more gene sites that are homozygous versus heterozygous. Take that back to like the horse kinds off the arc, then they would have more heterozygous gene sites and take the, those horses back to creation. There's your pre-existing heterozygosity. Don't you see how it's a downhill change? Like we're looking back in time to the expansion of the genome, but evolutionists, it's the opposite. You're looking back to a single celled organism billions of years ago. You're looking back to a contraction of the genome because from a single celled organism to now, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, monkey, bird, you know, monkey, man, um, that would require the expansion of genetic information versus how us. The how, do you, how do you know that? Well, if you started off with a single celled ancestor, how, how, large, how large was the genome of the universal common ancestor? Well, you tell me, I don't know, it's your story. Exactly, we don't know. So for you to say that I've got a problem because we need to add more information from the original common ancestor, you, you've jumped to that without actually providing a reason to- Well, no, to I'm not necessarily saying you have a problem. I'm just saying for clarification purposes, do you not see that it's, it's opposite expectations? Because we're looking, yeah back in time we're looking at an expansion of the genome we're looking back to the creation of these kinds and adam and eve that were front loaded with all these pre-existing functional dna differences over time through genetic processes recombination gene conversion isolation divergence genetic drift all these things that lead to speciation we're now looking at the contraction of that originally expanded genome right because you're asking about the limits well i'm giving you an answer to the limits i just want to um, especially for the next conversation that's why we we reach walls or barriers in in um speciation potential because those gene sites that were heterozygous we're losing them over time i think you'd need to provide papers on that though i, I think you're getting that from the idea of genetic entropy is that true no, no, I mean genetic entropy because remember, we explained the vast majority of DNA differences as the result of uh, created DNA diversity. But the genetic entropy model would say, yeah, we're accumulating mutations um, since creation. But evolution says all those DNA differences were mutation. I'll, I'll tell you what, I do have papers on that. I'll send those to you. You can look them over. And then the next time we have a discussion, um, we could, uh, I guess, expand on this uh, conversation where we left off here. Sounds like a good plan. Okay. Uh, did you have any, any final words before we... I, I gave my final words. Okay. Well, I appreciate you giving me the chance there to ask another question. And yeah, like, like you, I really enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed uh, discussing snake evolution. We touched a number of really good topics. So I hope the uh, chat had fun. Uh, Can Matt, I, do you understand my point? I just want to clarify because I know this is in your book. Do, do you understand now that because we find legless snakes in the fossil record before legged snakes, that's not a problem. Well, I, I know according to like evolutionary theory, yeah, you guys would look to like loss of traits evolution, conversion evolution, um, things like this to explain why you would find um, snakes, the furthest you go in the fossil record that don't have legs, and then you'll find snakes with legs. Yeah, it's just like Tiktaalik, for example. I'll point out that you found tetrapod footprints in Poland that predate Tiktaalik. Yeah. Now, I understand that Tiktaalik, you'll say, it doesn't necessarily mean that that was the first transition. Yeah, that's why yeah. we have things as sister taxa rather than putting things as nodes. Exactly, yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I agree with, um, like, the evolution, I guess I want to say, story of it. You know, I, I understand that, yeah. That's my final word, then. I'd like to see that correction in your book <laughs> well, i'm not saying that like i'm, I'm just saying i understand the expl it, it, would, it would be almost like um an evolutionist saying like you do understand why you know we expect dogs to produce dogs based on the law of monophily right we wouldn't expect a dog to give birth to a cat that would be me like saying well no i understand that it's uh, genes and traits that are inherited and of course based on the law of monophyly you know uh, eukaryotes are always going to produce eukaryotes mammals are always going to produce mammals i understand that i don't agree with it supporting evolution so th th that's kind of what i mean like i understand what loss of traits evolution is i understand what convergent evolution is i just don't believe that it rescues you from the problems okay
I hope that makes sense. But I do understand like what you're saying. Yeah, I agree that that makes sense in the evolutionary worldview. But remember, we don't look at all those snake fossils in the geologic column, and we don't look at that column like it's uh, different ages, millions and millions of years. We believe that it was all created in, in one um, year-long worldwide flood. So, But we can talk about that later, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. But also, I appreciate it. I hope the audience had fun. Matt, um, hopefully you didn't fall asleep while Adam and I were uh, <laughs> blabbering on there. <laughs> yeah, you saw final nice. words, brother, and we'll shut her down. Uh, no, no, no final words. It was good. I just, I'm just here to chime in. <laughs> Awesome. Adam, like I said, it's always a good time. I hope you always feel like you got enough time to talk and that it's respectful. And um, we'll touch on a few things in our next discussion. So we'll hand it over to Praise for uh, his final words and he can shut it down. I'd, I'd like to recommend this book on the right. It's The Variety of Life. It's, it's a brilliant book for this sort of stuff on cladistics and taxonomy. I'd also recommend reading Raw Matt and Standing for Truth and uh, Jason Ezard. Uh, their book, 100 Falsifications for Evolutionism, uh, it's a good bit of homework for anyone who wants to look into fact checking and sourcing. I think it's a, it's a good bit of homework for that. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.